It's time now for the Hershenfelds. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst. He's the real deal, a real live psychiatrist. And also joining us is comedian Ethan Hershenfeld, actor Ethan Hershenfeld, <laughs> and artist Ethan Hershenfeld, and author of the book right behind me, Today Is Now, which has the Feldman guarantee. Go by Today Is Now, and if it doesn't make you laugh, and if it doesn't change your life, I will reimburse you. That is my promise. And I you. will defibrillate you. <laughs> if that does not make you laugh, you are in arrhythmia. <laughs> <laughs> without a defibrillator. You're up, up, a, you're up a, an arrhythmia without a defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> and who wrote Today Is Now? Your alter ego. Today Is Now is written by my alter ego, um, my nom de plume, mm -hmm. uh, my nom de guerre, uh, Dr. Samuel Benjamin, founder and chief emotional officer of the New York American Institute of Eclectic Modality Therapy, EMT, <laughs> registered trademark. <laughs> by the way, if you had to choose between nom de plume and nom de guerre, <laughs> which one, if you had to choose one, and what would it be? Well, the pen is mightier than the sword, so nom de plume. <laughs> and that way, your nom de plume could also be your nom de guerre. Exactly. Two, wow. bears, two plumes, one stone. I think we should just stop right now, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. I don't think we can get any more brilliant than that. Let me ask Ethan, since you're not a real Freudian psychoanalyst and you can't get into trouble doing armchair yeah. Diagnoses, even though you are literally <laughs> sitting on an armchair. What? What was that called? The uh, the the, Sh the Schmonick rule. Who is that? Goldwater. The Goldwater. The Goldwater rule. Yeah. What's the Goldwasser rule? What is the gold? What's the Goldwasser test? That's the that's the original. It's the Goldwasser. And what is that test for? That test for um, stool in your urine. <laughs> It's a very rare condition. You don't want to know how you get that. Don't ask. Move on. <laughs> what is the Goldwasser test? I forgot. Okay. I, I think it's for some venereal disease. I, I, I think. I think you're. I think you're right. Goldwasser is actually the German word for golden shower. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? No. Oh. So why did they name the test for syphilis after Goldwasser? Who was Goldwasser? Some guy put his <laughs> name on the test. Whatever he was doing, he was having a great time. <laughs> he was really living it up in those years before antibiotics. <laughs> okay. Speaking of living it up and having a great time. Two weeks ago, we talked about... Uh, Archbishop George Santos, who plays center field for the Yankees and did such a great job last year, we decided to send him to Washington, D.C. as a congressman. Amazing man who has built a house of lies, starting with his sexuality. And no, we don't know that. Right. Do we know that? We know he had a wife, but a lot of people have have relationships that might not be in concordance with their sexual desires for example a lot of people are in heterosexual marriages and they're heterosexual but they would rather be having heterosex with other people <laughs> so you know the marital status doesn't necessarily comport with the sexual proclivities am i wrong doctor? yeah I, I you are quoting freud right there okay Okay, but but no, I know what you mean. He was married to a woman. Then he purported to be uh, yeah. he was taking communion. Then he purported to be a chassid. Right. He's <laughs> asked backwards. Most Jews lie and deny that they're Jewish. He right. lied and said, I'm a Jew. Most closeted gay men lie and say they're straight. He kind of lied about being in a gay marriage. He's doing everything ass backwards. Well, he's, 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 he's trying to, yeah, he was doing it all for the votes. All for the votes. Yeah. Matt Schlapp is the father of five daughters. He's a good Christian conservative. 
He Matt w- Tevya Schlapp. The Tevya. <laughs> but he's not. That somehow he got that middle name. His father was a milkman, but not from the shtetl. Matt Schlapp, good man, married to Mercedes Schlapp, lobbyist for the National Rifle Association. They've they have five daughters. He's a good Christian conservative. He runs CPAC. They invited Victor Orban, the Hungarian leader who is persecuting gays in Hungary and is against the woke culture. Big conservative Matt Schlapp. But there's been a problem this week that I know you're you're aware of, but it's not getting a lot of traction nationwide. Apparently, he was working for Herschel Walker. He went down in October of last year to help out on the Herschel Walker campaign. And a male staffer has come forward claiming that he was driving Matt Schlapp around and Matt Schlapp allegedly kept fondling him and, quote unquote, pounding his junk. This is the reporting that Jamie Gangell from CNN has been doing. These are the texts that the the male staffer saved for posterity. Okay, that's not playing. We also obtained a brand new text message exchange that's being made public for the first time. And this is it. A staffer text slap to inform him he's not going to drive him. He says, I did want to say I was uncomfortable with what happened last night. The campaign does have a driver who's available to get you to Macon and back to the airport. According to phone records we've reviewed, Schlapp tries to call him a couple of times. Then a few hours later, he sends the following text message. If you could see it in your heart to call me at the end of the day, I would appreciate it. If not, I wish you luck on the campaign and hope you keep up the good work. And, and this is this. This is the other. Uh, this is the other text that he, the staffer sent to a friend. He's pissed I didn't follow him to his hotel, hotel room. I just don't know how to say it to my superiors uh, that this surrogate, the surrogate being Matt Schlapp, fondled my junk without my consent. So that would these are the alleged charges against Matt Schlapp, conservative family man, Republican. Your, Your thoughts, Ethan? Yeah. First of all, as a as a fake doctor, let me just begin by saying. There is a there is a vast difference between a fondling and a groping. <laughs> fondling, up until quite recently, fondling was was socially acceptable in most settings. A fondle is basically a caress <laughs> with a little more concupiscence. <laughs> it's just a caress that with a semi erection it's it's just a, a slightly <laughs> over the line from a, a very friendly caress a fondle suggests that there's a, a hope for a future for the fondle the fondle one hopes would then develop but he did not grope anybody a groping is like a it's like a move uh fit for a linebacker well but th- but that is what well the 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 the, the male staffer is claiming that he was fondling and caressing and groping all at the same oh, time. Did he actually say the, the G word? Did he grope? It? I, I do believe the G word was okay. used. Yes. The other, and again, I'm just playing uh, Schlapp's advocate. Here, <laughs> the, the possibility exists that Schlapp behaved like, I dare say, like a gentleman, because you notice that the staffer in his text message to his friend says, he hoped that I would follow him back to the room. In other words, he was not coerced to come back to the room. He wasn't bribed. He wasn't threatened. None of those Trumpian maneuvers were deployed. He simply made it clear that he wanted this staffer and his staff back in. in, Right. But the staff was being touched. He was touching the staffer's staff, which is crossing the line. That's true. That is you want to you want to make sure to have uh, consent. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Now, what even is, in Georgia, that's considered even what? Polite. Even in Georgia, that's <laughs> considered polite. You're supposed to get consent before a groping, caressing, or fondling. Unless you're brothers. Well, yeah, that's. Uh, what is the I difference? I've told you this before, but um, uh, you know, in the Deep South, they actually use Pet Finder as a dating site. <laughs> What? What? Is, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, God! Oh. What is the difference between fondling and hondling? I always confuse the two. Well, sometimes a fondle and a hondle go together. If you're if you're at a brothel, that's a brothel fondle. fondle. So you, we want to get the best price. A hondle. That's when you bargain. Uh, so you have to do a little hondling before the fondle. Now, if you're on your way to the brothel and you're in the back of a jet. Backseat of a Japanese car, that's a fondle Honda Honda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Doctor, okay. let's talk to a real psychiatrist now. Yeah. That, that would be best. Yes. This you're a real psychoanalyst. Okay. And okay. I will put on my lawyer's hat right now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Can I do that? Yes, please. And I would Lawyer say, up. Lawyer up, Dan. That given the power differential between those these two people, a fondle, a handle, or a grope are all basically the same thing. They are aggressive. And therefore, this guy should uh, have his junk removed from him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Biblical. Well, uh, that, that is a good point. The I'm power dynamic. Point. Is it too late for me to switch my answer? I'm go <laughs> uh, how much did you wager first? Um, um, I wager $50, Alex. Okay. <laughs> so what is for $50? What is fondle? <laughs> <laughs> so d real Dr. Hershenfeld, the real psychiatrist. Oh, with That's that. I'm sorry. That's both of us. Yes, but the real, real psychiatrist. Yeah. Uh, is there, there's certainly schadenfreude on my part, because here is a conservative. Who, right. Get, getting this comeuppance. Or trying to come up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stairs with that guy. Um, I cleaned it up. Did you notice at the last yeah. minute? I, I, Very nice. I made it family friendly. Here is a gentleman, Matt Schlapp, a conservative who has spent a career coming out, not out of the closet, but against same sex marriage, othering people for the way they were born. But here, if this is true, and I want to ask you why somebody would lie about this, but if it is true. What does that say about politics and conservative politics that's rooted in uh, morality and social issues and othering people? I don't think it says a thing about politics or conservative politics. It says something about the human condition, and we've seen this a hundred times, where people rant and rave against something, only to be found out that they're ranting and raving against something within themselves that they find despicable. And it can be a cover, or it can be a psychological mechanism where they're actually, you know, fooling themselves into believing that they are not this hated thing. Right. Um, now, in his defense, and he is indefensible, he's not a doctrinaire when it comes to homosexuals. He's not pounding the pulpit and railing against gay people. He did try to introduce some gay members to CPAC. So he's he's not like a, you know, he's not Ralph Reed. He's not, and he's not Victor Orban, but he has certainly aligned himself 
with a party that wants to persecute a a part of him. Right. Um, I, I I wanted to say I did see him once on on Bill Maher, and uh, it seemed like they were very cordial, and it, it was clear that Maher had had him on a couple of times, and he seemed. I disagree with all of his positions, but he seemed reasonable. That was my take on the guy. He, he didn't seem like, like just like you're saying, he didn't seem like like a zealot. Uh, he seemed wrong-headed, but 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 not a zealot. So, well, let me ask the person who's not a psychiatrist, yeah. based on the real doctor's interpretation, the things we rail against the most sometimes, not always are the things we either want to destroy inside of us or protect ourselves from becoming or acting out. Do you, do you, right. do you buy that as a fake doctor? Um, completely. Yeah. I think that that's exactly right. Um, I was going to say in my own life, what I've noticed, but I very quickly did an inventory and I don't suffer from that myself. So, um, <laughs> So that was that I struck out. I was going to uh, um, I'm very well adjusted. I don't know if I've described that or if that's come across. No, I get that. A few years of doing that. I know. By um, the way, you're strangling your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little too tight. OK, now who is this again? This is Fafner or Fafi. She's a 12 and 12 year old Chihuahua Shih Tzu. Uh, a sh uh, Chihuahua Shih Tzu. You can make up your own. Right. Monto for that. She's a wonderful dog. Um, so I'm trying to think in my own life. No, honestly, the thing that you hate or 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 try to control other people and stop them from doing it, it's because it's something that deep within you, you know that you have that urge, but you loathe it. Yes. So, yeah. No, I'm trying to think. I, and in my life, I, I and I'm not fishing for compliments and I doubt I'll get one with you two. The, uh, I uh, deep down inside, I fear that I'm stupid, that, uh -huh. that, I, that I don't measure ah, that, up. That's good. It, that's good. So then you're, you you got to point out any little errors or stupidity in other people. No. Well, no. But I gravitate to people who are who I think are intellectuals, who I think read a lot, who I think are, are smart and right. and I do like to bully conservatives for being ill-informed that I got do it. do because I and, and I think it it's partly because I'm insecure about my my hard drive not I actually have the the same insecurity and I wonder if that's a thing common to a lot of comedians no what I think Dr. Hershenfeld, the real psychiatrist. Yeah. I think comedians know that they're really smart. So they're they're not afraid of acting like morons. Oh. That's what I, I think. I think comedian good comedians have to be very smart, as a matter of fact. And whether they know it or not. Bad comedians, they can be whatever. Right. But it's it, it's a very clever use of wordplay and seeing connections and seeing reversals. And it, it, it requires a good brain. Right. The new Congress went into session. The 118th Congress came into session this week. What is the psychological condition where you talk about everything and anything except the most important thing? When, it, when, when a couple is complaining about, you know, his table manners or the way he drives, what, what, is, what is that when, when people fight about things that are not what the problem is? What, what is that? It's called... Human humanity. <laughs> I would also call it avoidance. 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 Yes. Now, what is avoidance? Avoidance is like if you're driving down down the road, and suddenly there's like a raccoon jumps out into the middle, and you swerve. That's avoidance. Well, but but in the psychological condition oh, of avoidance yeah. would be yeah. there's a raccoon. 
that is right in front of you. And you pretend there's no record. Your wife says, I think there's some bird poop on the windshield. Why don't you turn on the wipers? Right. Yeah. Or is that correct? Real Dr. Hershenfeld? Well, I'll tell you what is correct. I just read, just today, I read that some state out, you know, west of the Hudson River, I don't know which one, doesn't matter, is having a plague of raccoons. Why are they having a plague of raccoons? Because you used to get, I think they said $40 for a coon skin. And now you can only get $7. So nobody's killing the raccoons anymore, which I think is excellent. But what would you do with raccoon skin? Oh, is, is that related to what you're talking about? Other than the fact that it was a raccoon. A raccoon, yeah. It's a raccoon. <laughs> right. Why, why did, what do people do with raccoon skin? You make a hat. Like Davy Crockett. Or you can make underwear. I once saw that. I saw a raccoon underwear. No, really. <laughs> really? With the claws? Yeah. No, Wouldn't no it claws. be great if you have like the claws right near the opening for the, you know, where you pee? You know, and, and you have like some kind of string attached so the claws grab the opening and you don't you don't or, have to hold it? Or you fashion them so that the claws are just always coming out over the waistband. <laughs> <so it looks laughs> <like, laughs> Um, you, see, you see how intelligent comedians are. Well, he I mean, is in this in this conversation. He's we brilliant. Uh, we had raccoons uh, in the Bronx where yeah. I was growing up, and also right here on my fire escape in 1996 when I first moved here. I was sitting watching TV, and a raccoon. This is no joke. A family of raccoons walked up my fire escape like this. I was not hallucinating. I have a photo of it. it was, they're incredible animals. But when do they stop being cute? Well, it's just like the difference between a plant and a weed. It's really just our own uh, uh, formulated opinions about them. They're just, they're cute. They're great. Do you remember not... when you used to feed them Cheerios? They used to put their hand out? And... No, I don't remember that. But Oh, really? Yeah. Out the back kitchen door we, in, in the Bronx, we used to feed them Cheerios. But well, raccoons, there's something about their paws. Are they rodents? I think they are. So yeah. there's something not appetizing about them. I like, I like rodents. They're so sort of human. They're yeah. what? Their hands are so, sort of human. Yeah, I think they're, they're, uh, they're great animals. And um, I, th I guess they're underrated. Because I, I don't think of them as vermin. I but I like vermin. I mean, this whole obsession with rats. <laughs> oh, I love a vermin. Uh, what is vermin? A vermin is like it's just like a plant and a weed. It's an animal and a vermin. It's just you impute some. Well, now, what what, what is the difference when you call a human being? Because I've been called a rodent and I've been called vermin. What what, what you is, might have been misheard? It might have been just someone calling you vermin, <laughs> <laughs> which was a sort of an anti-Semitic. <laughs> Or even Herman. <laughs> Herman Berman. <laughs> what is it? What would you rather be called? A rodent or vermin? Okay. Rats are fine. Everyone's obsessed. So how do we get rid of the rats? Stop trying to get rid of them. They're fine. They're just part of the city. They're rats? All... Yes. They're <laughs> Why are they you are sneezing? Amazing. They're amazing animals. I just yeah. got allergic. I don't know what happened. Um, there's an organization called Apopo, which I I, uh, I, I want to tell people about. A-P-O-P-O. -O. Look them up. A-P-O-P-O. -O. It's an organization that trains these uh, Gambian pouch rats to sniff out landmines. They're brilliant creatures. They're smart. They're loyal. And, and they don't grope. They're not gropers or fondlers. Because, no, because they stepped on land. They have no hands to grope with. No, no, no. They don't step or do anything. They're too light to trigger them. They learn how to sniff them out, and then the the humans dig the things up before they. Oh, you know, but you got to keep you got to keep them thin, though. True. Now, Doctor <laughs> Hershenfeld. Yeah. Your son is a silent sneezer. He's been holding back his sneezes. When I sneeze in Manhattan, they can hear me in the Bronx. 
Oh, do you yell when you sneeze? I sneeze. It's a, it's a boisterous celebration of uh, yeah. my my nose. So what what was, is? Go ahead. Me me too. My kids always used to make fun of me. I think they would say boo ha or something. Yeah, you like that. would say bruha. You would uh, vocalize the words bruha when you sneeze. So what is um, that? What is that? What does that say that you're a loud sneezer? And your son, look at that. He, he has shame associated with his sneeze. Jesus, I really just got so allergic. I don't know what happened. But, but, but what is what, it? What are you? What What is it? You're, you you hold your nose. You're you you very quiet sneezer. I'm trying to spare your <laughs> audience. <laughs> oh, I just pulled a muscle. Okay. <laughs> I was doing I was doing a an internship after freshman year in college at CNN Business News. It was the only thing I could the only internship I could find for those six weeks. The only most people would kill for that. No, it was unpaid. Lou Dobbs was a screamer. He was very unpleasant. Oh, really? Go on. How yeah. were his gums? Last week we learned about Barbara Walter's gums. Tell me about I would, Lou, Lou Dobbs. I would characterize Lou Dobbs' gums as flocculent. What does that mean? What's the word flocculent? Sort of puffy and cloud-like. And he has those. No, no, no. no he was a, he was a screamer. But what I wanted to say is. Well, you can't go, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You just can't say that. Give us a piece of gossip and move yeah. on. Lou Dobbs from CNN. 35 years ago. Was a screamer. Yeah, he was a screamer. He was one of those loathed bosses. Who's, he was like a cliche. He would come in and yell at people. And people, right. yeah, they didn't like him. Get but, out of my country. Well, <laughs> he, he, he was, this was before he was political. He was just business news. That was right. his thing. So anyway, um, there was a woman, another undergrad, who was on an internship at the next desk. Very cute. Um, you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to say that. I was 18. She was probably 18 or 19. Yeah, but you're, not, you're not allowed to remember if somebody was pretty or cute. It's well, here's what she said. This was she basically verbally groped me. Here's what she said. I sneezed once and she said. I love sneezing. I, it's it's the closest thing to an orgasm. Have some pepper. <laughs> so, I was like quiet. I didn't know what to say. And then later, an older guy who worked, who actually had a job there at CNN Business, he came up to me. He's like, dude, you just totally blew that. That was such an opening. Why, why didn't you say anything, you numbskull? <laughs> I, who wants to go out with a woman who's into sneezing? Who knows what you can come home with? Yeah. You get the cold, the flu. Well, yeah. this has been really fascinating. Let's go back to Matt Schlapp who's been accused of allegedly fondling another man's junk. What would motivate somebody to make that up? What is the, the pathology of a, a falsely accusing uh, a man of molesting you? Why would somebody do that? Well, what you want a, attention? You could be setting up a lawsuit. Yeah. Um, it could also be a form of flirtation and foreplay. <laughs> like you want to see the guy again. Yes. You want to put the idea in his head. Yeah. Of, but you want to be surrounded by lawyers next to, like, that's Right. That's another fetish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Most people aren't going to report that kind of thing unless it really happened. Right. The, uh, even beyond that, I was, I, you know, I'm a, I was coming up in the eighties and I had a few episodes where I had people who inappropriately made moves. Um, not only didn't I make stuff, I, I wouldn't report or ever talk about when those things did happen. I think that's most people don't even talk about it when it does happen. Right. Again, making it up when it doesn't. Now I have been, I'm being serious here. There have been several male comedians who have grabbed me inappropriately downstairs and it wasn't it, it was all about power it was it was like look what i can do and you're not going to do anything about it but it wasn't oh. it wasn't 
sexual in nature. Am I misreading that, Doctor? I, 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 I disagree. If it were simply about power, they could have socked you in the jaw. You know what? I'm not sure that that's true because I know what you're talking about, David. I had a guy, a boss at an opera company in Venice. He came up to me and he was, it wasn't sexual at all, but it was, it was flirtatious. He kind of gave me a kind of, I think he actually pinched my cheek, but in a very aggressive, um, <clears throat> and it felt exactly like that. He was simply saying to me, I can do what I want to you. Right. You work for me, screw you. And it was a power play because I was a, I was just a singer and I needed to stay in the good graces of the uh, artistic director of the theater. So, yeah. Right. And last question, and this is, I don't mean to be flippant. Why is it more traumatic to get fondled than punched? Or is it? Um... A good question. I think they both can lead to a feeling of helplessness and um, I remember coming home from Hebrew school. Yeah. And and the rabbi had punched me in the stomach. And I said to him, I, I said, I don't want to mention the rabbi's name, but I said, Rabbi so-and-so punched me in the stomach. And my father said, good, somebody has to. I said, you're not going to go complain. He go, we, for, he, my father committed the cardinal sin. What did you say? I said, prove there's a God to me. And the rabbi punched me in the stomach. That was, that was a, both pedagogically and theologically. That was a terrible <laughs> reply. <laughs> What say that again? I was laughing. What? I said both pedagogically and theologically that was a terrible reply by the rabbi because he didn't he didn't prove it and he it was ter that was just a terrible moment by the rabbi. I think he did prove it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Punched him in the stomach and thereby said, "You think this is bad." <laughs> Wait till the good Lord gets a hold of you. But the, it doesn't prove in any way that there's a God. It does. And also, it turns off the student. It, it it proved to me there was a God. Oh, okay. All right, I'm wrong. The, the, <laughs> the hand of God. In this. But if I had said, if I'd gone home and said to my father, uh, I said, prove there's a God, and the rabbi <laughs> fondled me, I, I like, I think my father would have... Right. Gone in. Right. And so nobody fondles baby. Nobody. Well, I, I will say that um, I had I had that. Yeah. And, and I wasn't I mean, I remember being punched and I have been punched several times as a child. Uh, not as traumatic. Right. It's just, it's it's something you remember and you move on. I think I think the answer let me try giving a real serious answer, Dr. Hershenfeld, real Dr. Hershenfeld. Getting punched doesn't ruin violence for you. Getting fondled can hurt love for you, can hurt, can can make sex, can sometimes confuse sex. I like it. I like that. Is that near? I was sexually assaulted as a 10th grader, let's say, in high school. However, the assault failed because I had been working for years in my father's garage all summer swinging a heavy sledgehammer. And I was much stronger than the guys who tried to do it. And therefore, and I know they did this to other people. When you say guys, you mean rabbis. <laughs> One of them was. <laughs> Ultra With orthodox. No respect Ultra. To the Jewish people. <laughs> None whatsoever. And it was not traumatic because I prevailed. 
I, uh, the, you know, I was throwing furniture around and they finally gave up. I know other people who did not prevail. And like you say, it was it was deforming to them. Right. right. They blamed themselves. They felt helpless. Yada, yada. Right. They needed to put on phylacteries to get a boner. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> phylacteries? <laughs> you know, a pro, what is the difference between a prophylactic and a phylactery? It's uh, one is rubber, one is leather. <laughs> <laughs> Both turn me on. <laughs> They're actually the same thing because the phylacteries prevent you from going to hell. <laughs> right. They're both preventative measures. Yeah. yeah. The phylactery is there to remind you. It's like putting on a uniform to remind you that you're talking to God. Right. There you go. There you go. I don't, I don't remember. Honestly. I think so. That the and uh, a condom is uh, to. OK, uh, let's find out what you're reading. This was fantastic. This fa one of the best ones we've ever done. And they're all great. I just read Surviving Autocracy by Masha Gessen. I recommend it. It's great. Uh, came out at the beginning of the pandemic. That I believe but, she was my third wife. This is a right. This is her memoir about being married to me. Oh, Surviving Autocracy. That's good. I think I read so, that when yeah, Trump. It, Trump. I thought it was going to be about Putin, but it's more about really about. Trump and what yeah. we can learn about how to how to combat autocracy. But interestingly, she wrote it before, well before. Uh, in fact, she wrote it before the pandemic, and then she wrote an extra epilogue after the pandemic, but before the election in 2020. So it was unclear whether we were dealing with a four year or an eight year attempt at autocracy. It's a it's a terrific, <clears throat> a terrific book. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. Uh, maybe we can talk about this next week down in Brazil. Thousands and thousands of people stood outside the the army headquarters and begged them to overthrow Lula. They begged for a military dictatorship. They and it it's so wow. alien to to me and I think most Americans. But there are people, real Dr. Hershenfeld, who crave. A military dictatorship, an autocracy would be very happy. Yeah, yeah. It's in the balance. Yeah, there's all these. I think it's part of that gun nut cowboy culture, the fantasy that these. That the army is the good guys, the cops, are the good guys, the guys with the guns are the good guys. We want to be part of them. We want them to come to the rescue, that cavalry fantasy. It's pernicious. It's idiotic. And uh, it's right. un-American, but they have this fantasy that it's American. Right. Great yeah. conversation. And what are you reading, Dr. Hirschenfeld? I am reading an amazing book called My Quarrel with Hirsch Raciner. And it's about an argument between two guys. Um, the author is Grada. Chaim Grada, Chaim Grada. But the reason this is such a brilliant book is because the quarrel is actually within the author. And he is explicating it by using these two different characters. And the essence of the, ar of the argument is... These two guys meet in the Paris subway in 1948. They had been students together. They are both surprised that the other is alive because everybody else has been killed. So the argument is between these guys, one of them says, how can you still believe given what happened? And the other guy says, how can you not believe, 
given what happened. It's a it's a short book. It's it's I think it's amazing. Great. I'm glad you're reading it. I'm reading again. And one of the things uh, we have to wrap it up. I apologize to me. Okay. Reading is an act of faith. Reading is a mini Sabbath. When anybody who can read in the middle of the week is saying to the universe, it's going to be OK. The, the, the world is bountiful. I don't need to be running around like a chicken with their head cut off. I can sit and read a book for an hour and and everything and I can return to the world and everything will be fine. It really is a leap of faith to pick up a book and read. It's it's a religious experience in many ways. It's a good point. Especially when you're reading the protocols of the elders of Zion, I find. I'm a <clears throat> I'm still waiting for the movie of that. <laughs> Thank you. Go okay. buy the great book to buy is Today Is Now. Today Is Now. Available on Amazon. Yes. Today Is Now. Today Is Now. Buy it. If it doesn't make you laugh, I will uh, reimburse you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Dr. Thank Hershenfeld. You. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, great. Thank you. Bye. Bye, y'all. If you enjoyed this segment of The David Feldman Show, please hit the like button. Please Subscribe to this channel and please join us for office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Go to my website for the link. All you need is Zoom. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Well, Emil Guillermo joins us. He's the host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And he's also a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Let's do some ASMR for the eyeballs. Dave in Pennsylvania, who is that handsome lad? Has it been that long, David? You don't recognize Chad? Well, I, I know it's Chad. And and he's back from prison and he got a tattoo. Oh, he got tons of ink. Some of it he can't show you. What does he have on his chest? What does that say? F U. That's a yeah. prison tattoo. Yeah. That would stand yeah. for it took that, a lot of big pens. <laughs> that would be uh Feldman University, which is a gang it's an actual gang in, in It would be, yes. Yeah, in in some uh, OK. And what will you be building? Makes the Nazis tremble. What? <laughs> uh, hi, Chad. And he's got his hook. He did lose his he did lose a hand. Uh, Quick question. Since the meals here, is Chad classified as an animal? Mm, I would think uh, uh, I have a spe he has a special category, I think. <laughs> I, all his own. I, th I think I think I think not. So what the hell? All right. What are you oh, whoa. <laughs> that was uh, what are you going to be making for us today? Well, I don't have to ethically treat him, do I? No, you don't. So what? anyway, since your memory's going a long time ago, I did the F. Yes. And now the, the U is almost faded. I've been wanting to F you since like the fall. So. Right. So now I'm going to carve the U for the F you for the plaque. For the uh, the uh, university, for the dean's office. Wow, wow. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to mute you, and we'll watch you and the F. We'll watch the F and you, and talk to Emil Guillermo about Kiki Kwan, uh, Diane Feinstein, whether or not she's going to run for re-election, who's going to replace her, possibly. But first, yeah, the Justice Department, Merrick Garland, has appointed an independent counsel to look into whether or not President Biden as vice president mishandled classified documents. And there's an independent counsel. Who is the independent counsel? Uh, the special counsel is That's Robert right. Herr, H-U-R. But when I first heard it, I thought, what are his pronouns, this Robert Herr guy? I, you know, the thing about Robert Herr, when I first saw the press conference, it was Merrick Garland next to this white guy. So I thought when they announced the special counsel that it would be uh, just another, you know, white uh, 
prosecutor type in, in Washington. And then because her was not with Merrick Garland at the, at the announcement. And then later on, it was shown that this guy's Asian American. And I, I was really kind of surprised because, uh, well, you knew that Merrick Garland would have to pick someone who had a conservative bent, but, you know, I didn't I didn't think that it would be someone like her, but apparently he's a veteran in, you know, he was a, in the U.S. attorney's office. He was U.S. attorney in, 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 in Maryland. He has gone after uh, white collar crimes. He's gone after conservatives. I think that's probably his best thing, that he's gone after white supremacists. So we know that here's a guy who has a conservative bent politically. But he actually. Well, if he's going after white supremacists, that suggests he doesn't have a conservative bent. Well, he has, you know, he worked under the Trump administration. He worked, uh, he was an assistant to uh, Rod uh, Rosenstiel, you know, the guy in, in the, the one of, uh, in, in the, the Justice Department of Trump. He was in the. Right. Yeah. It, it's just that he's, he's got conservative. Uh, uh, bona fides, as they say, but he's fair. He's impartial. So he passes muster. Let's see what he finds. I mean, I, I think that, you know, Biden has, for whatever reason, if he forgot or how it happened, uh, he's given the Republicans something that they'll continue to beat, beat him up on, even though it's not analogous, you know, what he did, what Trump may have done. Uh, or not, what even Trump did. not even close. Not even close. Although yeah, not- it was learned right before the election and it could have been announced before the election, before the. Yeah, th- that's like the only thing. But in terms of sheer mass, sheer volume. Right. Not analogous. Or and, and lack of cooperation. I mean, the, the, Trump's yeah. lawyers didn't cooperate. And, right. the, and I mean, the files were left out at Mar-a-Lago. People had access to the offices. Apparently, th- this was in uh, the Biden Center, it locked away in an office. He didn't know. look. I, I'm no fan of Joe Biden's, but there's no way he could remember what the classified material was. And we everything is classified. Everything yeah. is over classified. Well, we don't know who put it away for him. If someone did it by accident, uh, we do know that in the case of Trump, uh, he was told con- you know, repeatedly to give back the documents. And then he actually moved the documents within, you know, his, you know, his private quarters. So um, I, I, it's just not analogous. No. And yet we will hear about this uh, to no end until Robert Hur comes, you know, gets to the bottom of this. I think though that Robert Hur will become uh, just like Robert Mueller, right? He'll become a kind of a, you know, a cultural figure, you'll see an Asian face. And, you know, I write about race and diversity. That's kind of significant that people will be looking at Robert Hur on, on the right, wanting some kind of redemption for how Trump was treated. Like they're already asking questions like, well, they raided Mar-a-Lago. Why don't they raid all the places where, where, you know, where Biden, you know, supposedly had things, you know, he, he will be uh, right there close to the top. And people will be thinking about an Asian American as conservative, but maybe impartial and possibly fair. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what, he, what he's got. Apparently, very good uh, prosecutor. Right. Uh, he's got uh, well connected. Oh, he uh, went to Harvard um, and Stanford, Stanford Law. So he's got that kind of pedigree. And he would clerk for Rehnquist. So, okay. you know, that's his, his conservative bent. Anyway. Uh, I think it's uh, and somebody's going to pay a price for this. Yeah, I mean, somebody there has to be a fall guy. They're going to have to put one head on a stick because the Democrats claim they follow the law for the most part compared to Republicans. They do. So Mm -hmm. they will have to put a head on a stick to make an example and prove to the American people. Democrats follow the law, even though. You can indict a ham sandwich. We all break the law. But if you come under the spotlight and it's political, somebody, somebody suffers. Yeah. 
I, I guess we're going to get into the detail about who packed the boxes, who brought the boxes. Uh, those are the likely fall guys, people in whatever division, you know, called the shots. But, you know, Biden is going to, you know, play it around with the idea that, oh, he had it parked. You know, he had his Corvette parked there and uh, where the second boxes are. But, you know, every day it seems like there's one more document found. So but um, we learned with the Mar-a-Lago documents that there are certain levels of classification. Right. That's true. Oh, and, and so then, let's, see, know, let's see the, the, what. Joe Biden, the vice president, was trusted with. I doubt anyone even realized they stamped these documents classified. Let's turn to Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is almost 90. There's some articles that have been written saying she's barely functioning in in another year. She has to make a decision whether or not she's going to run for reelection to be senator from California. But already I, I, there are people announcing that they're going to challenge her. Katie Porter, who's been on the show, declared her candidacy. And she was criticized because California is getting this atmospheric river, torrential downpours. And people said it was inappropriate for Katie Porter to announce her candidacy uh, in a time of crisis. Who else is going to be running right. You know, it's kind of wide open right at, at this point. But, you know, if Feinstein, it depends on if, if she if she leaves early, that's an open question, too. She she's going to she's given herself some time during this um, atmospheric river crisis uh, that we have here. It, by the way, today where I am, it stopped raining. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we have more storms to come, uh, you know. This really kind of upsets the, you know, the musical chairs kind of thing, uh, the pattern, because, you know, what what's going to happen to Gavin Newsom, the governor? You know, he says he's not going to run for president. Might he be interested in the Senate position? He just got, you know, uh, got got his second term as governor. It won't be up until I think 2027. Uh, so. It might be that Diane Feinstein hangs in there until Newsom might be able to announce. I, I don't know, uh, but that's a possibility. Well, Katie Porter is in. If yeah, Diane she, Feinstein, if she, then Katie Porter is going to do a primary challenge. Yeah. Who do you think would win if Katie Porter challenges Diane Feinstein? I mean, well, she's, people she's love her. Katie Porter. Yeah, I know. Well, she's uh, what raised a million dollars so far. But here's the other thing. Uh, and this could happen, too. Uh, and to defeat that, you know, Katie Porter effort, if Dianne Feinstein leaves, then Newsom gets to appoint someone. And one of the people who he's talked about appointing is the African-American uh, congresswoman from Oakland, Alameda, uh, Barbara Lee who is uh, in the seat uh, that was occupied by Ron Dellums for so mm -hmm. long. And then when Dellums left, Barbara Lee uh, took over. And you is, know, she, she is she the one, is she the, Lee, is she the Lee who didn't vote for the war in Afghanistan? Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, like I said, stalwart progressive, uh, African-American representing uh, uh, Oakland, Alameda County, uh, Berkeley, and... She has told, uh, according to sources, reports, uh, she is she wants to run. But like I said, it, it all depends if if Feinstein goes all the way to the end of her term, because then there would be a primary challenge. Or if if Feinstein leaves early, I don't I don't know if that's likely. But if it does happen, Newsom gets to a point. Right. Well, let me ask you about Katie Porter versus Barbara Lee, because Katie Por Porter is a disciple of Elizabeth Warren. She's part yeah. of the Harvard Mafia. She's great. I love Katie Porter, but she is a Harvard opportunist. But I love her. Like Barbara Lee. Huh? Like Elise Stefanik. Like Elise Stefanik. The other side? Yeah. Tooling around Harvard in the BMW her father bought for her. Did you read that article? No, I didn't. Oh, it's Stefani. Yeah, I saw, I, I saw the headline. Yeah. yeah. Barbara Lee, 
Harvard? No, I don't think you so. vote, Then you got to vote for her because, if, and her judgment was correct. She was the only congresswoman who voted against going into Afghanistan. The only one. The you reward, one. you have to reward that. Yeah. And she has, I've noticed that she's been getting a lot of FaceTime, uh, you know, the, during the, uh, the transfer, you know, when uh, uh, McCarthy finally got the gavel, she gave a one minute uh, about she's, you know, very pro women's rights uh, on, on pro choice on, on abortion. That's been her main issue. I think it would be hard to defeat Barbara Lee. And uh, certainly if she has Newsom's backing, uh, that would be important. If, like I said, if, if she it will, if. Feinstein leaves early and she gets the appointment. That's a big boost to be appointed and then go into the primary as an incumbent. Right. Here's the difference between Barbara Lee and Obama. Hmm. Uh, Obama's bona fides in 2008 were he opposed the the invasion of Iraq, but he never had a vote on it. He wasn't a congressman. He wasn't a senator. He was in Illinois state the state house. Nobody asked him to actually vote on invading Iraq, but he was against it. He spoke out against it. Barbara Lee in Congress voted yeah. ag and was the only one. Do you think Barack Obama, had he been an Illinois congressman in 2002, would he have voted for the war authorization to go into Iraq? The answer is yes. Of course he would. He would have voted would. to go in. Yeah, he would. He wouldn't have said no. And he also said, speaking of Afghanistan, I mean, the big vote. The big vote is to vote against Afghanistan. People don't remember that was an easy vote. Everybody mm -hmm. said, yes, of course, let's invade Afghanistan. They brought the towers down. No, they didn't. They did not. The Taliban did not bring the towers down. Uh, uh, and if any, we, we might as well have invaded Pakistan because bin Laden was back and forth between Pakistan and Afghanistan. We got him in Pakistan. So we we could have invaded Pakistan after 9-11, but they had an atomic bomb. So they they said, well, let's it's, let's bomb Afghanistan. But it was a no brainer. And when Obama was campaigning for president, he said, we took our eye off the ball by invading Iraq. The real enemy is Afghanistan. So if you want to look at everything that's going wrong in Afghanistan, that was another war based on a lie. Obama got elected president perpetuating the lie that Afghanistan was behind 9-11. You know, we took our eye off the ball by invading Iraq. Afghanistan's the real enemy. And now you talk about somebody like Barbara Lee, who well, knew I, I, yeah, the only I one. That, she has to be rewarded for that. Yeah. Well, I think that Barbara Lee, uh, she's starting to ramp up her visibility. Uh, people know her in the Bay Area. Right. Uh, she wins her district, you know, by, you know, like 90 percent you know, majorities every time. I think she's ready. And what about Adam Schiff? Well, Adam Schiff, I don't know what the future is for Adam Schiff. I mean, he he's done a lot, uh, you know, the last couple of years, but he doesn't have that profile anymore. And uh, if he ran again, I don't, I, I, it's going to be tough, you know, for, for anyone to, I, I, you got to see, well, who's more famous? Who, who has, who really has, um, uh, you know, who would have the backing? I think, I think he would have some backing, but I think that progressives, if they can get behind Barbara Lee, and I think the Northern California establishment, if they right. get behind Barbara Lee, I think it'd be hard for, for Adam Schiff right. unless he came in with a ton of money. OK, let's uh, talk about the Golden Globes. Are they still relevant? And who is Kay Kwan? Uh, look, the Golden Globes really you want to give an awards uh, show and, you know, make fun of Tom Cruise. And, you know, if Steven Spielberg shows up great, you know, we might get some, you know, bump. Uh, 
everyone likes to see award shows and it's uh, actually they don't. The ratings were horrendous. I know the ratings were, were horrendous, but but people still uh, there's still a core group. It's not a, a lot of people. You know, you got to remember that they were off for two years because of the pandemic and and this thing about diversity. Because the Hollywood Foreign Press, no one knew there were a couple of Filipinos in the Hollywood Foreign Press, by the way. Not me, but I know a couple. Uh, anyway, but no uh, black, still, not, not a single black person. Well, the, and I think they added some this year to to make to make up for that. L.A. Times investigation. But I think it's important just, be, you know, if you follow the award season and how things go, and I think it gives an opportunity. Look, it's not so much the diversity within the group, although that was the point of the L.A. Times investigation, the diversity of the winners who get honored. That's the important thing. So that's why, to me, who, the so tell me about Kay Kwan. Jay Kwan is, uh, he was this guy who was in, uh, you know, Spielberg's, uh, you know, one of the first, uh, you know, the Temple of Doom movie. And he was one of the Goonies. He was a child actor. And he got, and and then he was waiting for, you know, his his career to skyrocket and it never did. And when he won, it was like after decades of doing, you know, behind the scenes stuff. And it was, it was great to see him win for his role as Wayman in everything, everything, everywhere, all at once, which is sort of like the darling multiverse movie, darling independent movie. But it was an, about an ordinary Asian American man. I have friends named Wayman. I know people like him who are kind of like soft spoken. And yet, you know, watch out because here comes, uh, you know, some kind of martial arts kick. Uh, he gave an, an acceptance speech where he could have spoken for Every Asian American out there, actor, uh, whatever profession, anyone who's an Asian American who's been beaten down, who has come back. It was an inspiring speech. And for 23 million people who have some Asian blood, it was it was great to see that kind of diversity at play at the Golden Globes. You got a dog? I got a dog for the holidays. I didn't want it. I mean, my my wife practically left all these hints around. Oh, Santa wants a dog for Christmas. Finally, I broke down. Here's the reason why. We we live near a shelter. The capacity is 180 animals. They were up to 250. And we did the responsible thing. How That's, old? Uh, we believe two. It's a little. It's a little brown. It looks like a Lakeland Terrier mutt, and we've named her Billy, you know, like, I guess so, like Michael Jackson's Billy Jean. Billy Fawn, because she's the color fawn, fawn color. Billy Fawn uh, Wren, because she's kind of bird like. Uh, holiday, because it's a holiday. So Billy Fawn Wren, Holiday Dog Guillermo. Yeah, that's her name. Yeah, I have, I, well, we'll get into it uh, next week about anthropomorphizing animals. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Giving them That's human the dog. names. I kick it. I G- kick it all. No, no, no. Just, you can't give animals human names. There's something I'm against that. You are, like, this is my uh, well, dog, Marvin. Is he a Marvin? <laughs> no, he's a dog. Wait, wait a a Marvin. Billy is a nice, Billy's you a dog name. You don't give human, no, you don't do that. I keep thinking of Billy Jean. I keep thinking of Michael Jackson. When I, yeah. Right? Okay. So, you are going to be doing theater in New York City. Yes. Sooner yeah, than I, we know, think. I, I have, And I know uh, a good, I know a kosher vegan Chinese restaurant that we can great. go to. Great. Yeah. Let's go. Look, I'm, I, I haven't done a fringe festival in two years because of the pandemic. So what is, thought, what is the play before, before we wrap up? The play up. is called uh, Emile Amok, Lost NPR Host Found Under St. Mark's and Other Stories. And so... So once again, Emil Amok, lost NPR host, found under St. Mark's. Which and weren't and, you in a Ishmael Reed play that was coming I'm, to New York? I'm going to be in an Ishmael Reed play in March at the theater for the, the new city, very small part, uh, uh, called The Conductor, about woke school boards, especially the one in San Francisco. So and that's in New York as well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's in New York as well. So I'm going to, you know, be there hanging out. And you know, what's weird, David, you're in New York now. Yes. And is what's the COVID situation? Because you now the emergency just came back for COVID. Uh, you know, the I'm not a doctor. I wear a mask, but I'm not a doctor. 
Okay, all right. So I, I'm I, not I, a doctor either. So I'm just, I, I, I'm just, and I don't have casual. Let's not do a casual conversation about it. Okay, it's horrible. No the situation is horrible, you. and everybody should get a vaccine and wear a mask. Emil Guillermo is the host of the PETA podcast, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, and read him over at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Follow him on Twitter at Emil Amuck, and he does a live stream every day on Twitter, on YouTube. What is the name of your YouTube channel? Uh, at Emil Amuck One. Fantastic. And you can see you can see replays at uh, www.amok.com. So. One last thing. The play February 16th under St. Mark's at the Frigid Fringe, Fringe in New York. So fantastic. Looking forward to it. Let's now go back to Dave and PA. And that looks great. Let's look at your you. Wow. F you. Oh, I like that. It's beautiful. Wow. And that's for the dean's office, huh? <laughs> F, F could be Filipino too. Dave. Yes, yes. Then it would be P U. That's no, no, no. <laughs> it would be pronounced P U. That's a different. Well, that's my my school of uh, proctol. Okay, not gonna. All right. Thank you, Dave and P A. I'll see you next week. Great job. Thank you, Emil Guillermo. Don't forget to join us for office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Go to my website for an invitation. We start at 8 p.m. I'm there for the first hour or two, and then the community takes over. People like Dave in PA will teach you woodworking along with Andy Brown. They will show you how to repair your, your home. And I believe that is the same scalpel that Dave and PA used on my facelift. I believe so. Yeah, well, that's the one that I remember. That's right. Thank you so much, Dave and PA. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn joins us. He is a lawyer, a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Not only that, he is a reverend, an actual reverend with the United Church of Christ. And for nearly a quarter of a century, he ran Americans United for separation of church and state. He's got a book coming out in about two months. They hope to get it out early March, early March. So we'll be talking yeah. more about that. Hopefully you'll do a book reading at at. Uh, Office hours and everybody I'll be happy to. Thank you. Matt yeah. Schlapp is the yes. head of CPAC. He is a conservative. He's married. He has five daughters. His wife is named Mercedes. She is a lobbyist for the National Rifle Association. These are good people. We may not agree with them politically, uh, but they mean what they say. You know, you got to respect conservatives. <laughs> He brings in Orban. I don't approve of Victor Orban speaking at at uh, CPAC. But I, I heard Victor Orban. Uh, he spoke of problems with the LGBTQ community being a little too influential in Hungary. So he kind of tamped that down and innocently began to persecute the gays. And he got a standing ovation. Uh, at CPAC, which is run by Matt Schlapp. And while I disagree with Victor Orban, I think Matt Schlapp is a good, decent Christian conservative who doesn't understand homosexuality. He's, he's never he's never been around it. So, you know, who's he hurting? What do you think? Yeah, well, Matt Schlapp, I, I think I was only on TV with him once on the old Ed Schultz show on MSNBC. But he uh, he's gotten into a little bit of trouble. Really? Because, yeah, because what happened? Not, what? What happened to Matt Schlapp? What happened to him? Uh, a few days ago, one of his uh, associates, both of them were working on the Herschel Walker campaign in Georgia. And while uh, while they were riding together in a car, uh, according to this staff member who is still anonymous at this point, 
Uh, he said that um, that Matt had grabbed his junk. And now for people who don't know what that means, um, you can look it up. Well, they're in the car and they're in the car. So they probably stopped for food at McDonald's and Matt possibly ate and it was all in a bag. And the staffer grabbed or Matt, Matt Schlapp grabbed the staffer's junk to, to throw <laughs> it to throw it out. Leftover garbage from the car. Sure. Is that? What yeah. You you sound like a person now who could be a tremendous defense attorney for bad people's practices. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. It's a, you're you saying know, he grabbed his junk. For, what does that mean? He, 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 his ball sack. His ball sack. Yeah. Oh. But that's only part of it, because not only did he, in the words of the staffer, fondled my junk, but he also pummeled it at length. See, that suggests that perhaps Mr. Schlapp thought that the junk uh, might be in a state of arousal. Therefore, he pummeled it. You know, I'm a minister. I don't really know any, any of these things, you, these you, terms, you, yeah. like, until I was uh, had to follow the Ed Meese pornography commission around the country uh, for the ACLU. Um, I didn't know anything about these. People. Well, you're saying that a conservative. Let me just see if I can understand yeah. what you're you're saying. Okay. You're saying a, a conservative, Matt Schlapp. Yeah. Who runs CPAC. And they are family values. He's married. Five daughters. Why would he be touching and pummeling a man's private parts? That makes no sense yeah. to me. Yeah. Well, um, it is not something that I would do, but I think we all know that within the gay community, in part because of the harassment that they were getting so long and for so in so many places, it's difficult to come out and say, you know, I am attracted to people of the same gender. So, so you're saying Matt hypocrisy. Schlapp? Wait, 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 wait. You're saying a conservative Republican opposed to yes. same-sex marriage. Yep. And and I think they call it religious freedom, the right That's of what they good call Christians not to have to bake a cake for a gay couple. Right. Okay, you're saying that Matt Schlapp allegedly has homosexual desires? It kind of looks that way to me. But that doesn't um, make any sense. Of course it makes sense. No, he's a conservative. He's against uh, no. homos. That he, makes no he's sense. A, he's a Christian conservative. And he is married and all of that. But so why would like, he be so, grabbing a man's penis? He, Reverend. He, he thought it would be. A, he, he thought it would be fun. To Reverend. Do Maybe he sensed that this staff member, again, whose name we don't know, um, maybe he thought he's one of us. I can get along with him. They had gone to two bars and, um, they were driving to Schlapp's hotel when Schlapp asked him to come up to his room in the hotel. The staff member said, I don't think so. And then he even rejected getting in a car to do some campaign event. The following morning, he got somebody else to drive uh, Matt Schlapp. Well, I'm confused. And it sounds like Matt Schlapp isn't confused. He knows exactly what he wants. What do you know about the Matt Schlapp marriage and family, Reverend? I don't know much about it. I do know that, that when Matt Schlapp uh, began to run CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, he actually was... He, said on a number of occasions um, that he wanted the Republican Party to be more open yes. to the gay community. Yeah. So he was it, was it burned up some of the people that were uh, total homophobes and obvious ones. But for a while, he looked like he might be on the cusp of seeing reason. Uh, but then as soon as he got the pushback from people that were more conservative and hateful, at CPAC, he all of a sudden didn't care so about. Put, yeah, put on your minister hat. Well, 
What is more immoral? Because I defended him in all seriousness. Yeah. I, I defended him earlier by saying in his defense, he did try to open up CPAC to log cabin Republicans. What is more evil? Uh, knowing that you're wrong and then not doing anything about it, like speaking out and then when you get pushback, surrendering and then going back into the closet and persecuting people who share your same sexuality or just hating gays and being in complete denial about your own homosexuality. As you're talking, I think it's more yeah. evil to to speak out in favor of law cabin Republicans. Right. They say no. And you keep your job. You don't fight for the law cabin Republicans. That's right. And you per, you perpetuate can't say the word per, perpetrate, perpetrate perpetuate uh, persecution of homosexuals. It's more evil. He's more, that makes him especially evil. Right, Reverend? I do agree with that. I think there's nothing like uh, I mean, it's from a moral sense, it is so uh, outrageous that people go on the attack of people just like they are, even if they don't want to admit it. I, I think that Matt Schlapp has done. But he disturbing. knows and what's what's so this, evil is he, is he knows no, better. No. He knows better. Yeah, of course he does. Right. Yeah. Is he done? Hmm? Is he done? You said he's done. Is he really done? Oh, no, I don't think he's necessarily done. I, I think what would happen, every news media person in Washington is looking to get the exclusive interview. He's already, through his lawyer, denied that any of this happened. And the guy who brought up these allegations said that he would come forth and speak publicly if Matt pushed back on these claims, which now, as of today, Matt Schlapp, through his lawyers, had done so. It's not true, he says. But everybody wants to do that. MSNBC would love to have both of them on at the same time. Right. And they could all just shoot it out right there on television. I, I think that's highly unlikely, but... Uh, they would love to do that in so, the same way. Look at all the the publicity that Prince Harry is getting. Well, let's get to that in a second. I wanted to ask you okay. a, th a theological sure. question before yep. we turn. Love the I love the sin, but I hate the sinner. Yeah, you you, you got that backwards. No, that's what I believe. Oh, so yeah. I, I, I no, love, I in other words, I love that Matt Schlapp uh, wants to sin. I love his sin. I just hate his him. I hate the sinner. What what you as as you ran Americans United for separation, church and state, you debated these people. They find grace and forgiveness through Jesus. What? How does how do they square all this well first of all they try not to be caught but if they are caught it depends on whether you're a hypocrite who happens to be a protestant or a hypocrite who happens to be catholic and one of the things that happened during my tenure there was uh uh D, uh jerry lee lewis's uh brother i can't even think of his name you know who he is. He, oh, oh, right, uh, Jimmy Swaggart. Yeah, Jimmy Swaggart. But not the, the brother. Time, they were they were cousins. They were cousins. That's that's right. true. They were cousins, which is why they almost got married. Well, they probably could because, of course, I think they both grew up in Louisiana. Right. And somebody said that that happens down there. No, but what he did the very first time he was caught in a motel with a hooker, he had a big public display in which he, he cried on national television. He apologized, but it didn't stick because a few years later, he was then caught in another hotel with another hooker. 
that time he chose not to make a public denial. It was very quiet. I have was, sinned. I have I sinned. Have, and that's that's good. That's like a, that's like a um, actor in Elvis and his uh, speech yeah. at the Golden Globes that you were talking about with Emil. But there's um, something different between Jimmy Swaggart and Matt Schlapp, because we're not saying don't hire adulterers, don't rent to adulterers. We're not persecuting adulterers in this country. We're almost celebrating adulterers. We persecute the LGBTQ community, specifically Republicans, conservatives and CPAC. It's not the same thing, is it, Reverend? No, it's not. Uh, but the, the only difference is that, of course, uh, in Swaggart's case, he had an enormous amount to lose. He was a very wealthy televangelist. And I think he thought in the second example, the second time he's called, I can get away with just saying, yeah, I'm sorry. Not big public displays. When people, including those in Congress who are Catholics, they can go when they engage in some kind of sinful practice. They can go just and announce, I, I, I spoke to the bishop and I have been forgiven. And that sells with a lot of Catholics. The Protestants of this world in general want you to be Jimmy Swaggart when he's caught with the first hooker. You want him to, in a very public way, not only say I did wrong, but demonstrate it in his case by crying about it. Right. That's the difference. Okay. So Matt Schlapp, what do we know his re, his religious bent? I don't know it. I don't know it. Okay. Nope. Your thoughts on Pope Benedict before we turn to Prince Harry? Yeah, I'm, uh, the Pope is still dead. Yeah, we're down to one Pope. Yeah, one. I'm not used to that. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to, you know, he was the spare, the heir and the spare. He was the spare. Let's, all right, let's talk about spares, <laughs> Prince Harry. I love Prince Harry. And I'm not being oppositional. Okay. I love him. I think he was dealt a, a, a hand that was unfair. And he's making the best of it. Uh, I, what else? What choices has this man had other than to do the right thing? And I think he's done the right thing every step of the way. But you don't think so. No, I think he did the right thing, but I don't understand the fascination with the whole royal family. I think this comes, I, if uh, Dr. Hershenfeld were still here, I, I believe that a lot of things happen in your childhood that set the tone for what you like and don't like later in life. The very first time I remember seeing any news event broadcast on television. I was visiting one of my aunts who was obsessed with watching the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. And I had to go out in her tiny backyard. I didn't know any kids. There was nobody to play with. And I just kept thinking, how long can this go on? It lasted the whole day. And I think that 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 was you an sure early you weren't memory. watching. You sure that wasn't a Yum Kipper service? <laughs> no. I, okay. All right. But here's the thing: when I did radio for a year and a half or so with Pat Buchanan every day, I would be horrified because Pat was very much into, uh, oh, the royal family. We should explore that. And every time the royal family would get into the news, I knew we'd have to spend at least one hour of the three hours each day we were together debating and discussing the royal family. And I just, I wanted to take a knitting needle to my head before I had a conversation with Pat about the royal family. Well, I mean... Prince he sold on 1.4 million copies I started, of this book. I started it last night. It's beautifully ghostwritten. And I mean that. Really? Well, it's right. beautifully ghostwritten. The writing well, he, is... I watched, I watched him on Colbert the other night, and he was, he was genuinely good. I mean, he, 
he was loose. He was uh, he, he tried to tell a couple of jokes and some of them were pretty good. I mean, that's fine. But it's the monarchy and the obsession that even Americans have with the monarchy. But he's trying to I destroy it. But he's trying to destroy the monarchy. Well, he he is. But I don't think this book is going to do it. I don't think the interviews he's doing are going to do it. I mean, I I think it's up to the British people themselves whether the monarchy is worth preserving. And every time there's a death of someone in the royal family, there are longer uh, there are longer lines to get into the services than there are when the Pope died. I, I mean, everybody they they want to see they want to watch. The, ser- the group of people walking to the church. I, okay, I just so find it appalling. When, when, it's appalling. It, it, when here is, I, I'm not going to justify the royal family. Okay. I, I yeah. understand that worshiping the royal family is like worshiping a statue of Jefferson Davis. I get that. When you look at Correct. The, the, what, yep. The colonization. And that had to be explained to me. I so I don't remember who in the community said that to me. Thank you for saying that message received. I I think it was for Ricky who said that to me or maybe Lane. I don't remember. But get, so what do I care? Get rid of them. They are fascinating. Hitler's fascinating. And I'm f- they are a metaphor, not you know, for all families. All families are troubled, and there, there's so it's played out in front of everybody, and you can compare and contrast your nightmare to theirs, and that is in some ways a gift. I remember yes. Pope John Paul, who preceded yeah. uh, Benedict. Um, was asked, you're really sick. You can barely function. Why don't you step down? He said, part of my job is to die in front of everybody. But I never forgot that. It reminded me of my stand-up act. And, but I thought, well, that's really a gift that he's giving to devout Catholics to, to part of his job is to grow frail and weak and, and I think in many ways, the royal family does that in, in, in a secular fashion, that they self-destruct uh, for all of us in, in a good way. This, um, I remember, you know, I'm sick, so I apologize in advance. When you say sick, you what know, do you mean? The... Um, is sick in the head? No, but it, it affects me. I can't, I can't think as clear. Well, what, what do you? What, what's okay, the so I'm with? walking down the streets in San Francisco with the editor at the time of the San Francisco Chronicle and a woman he was dating, and we were we were just walking down the street, and a guy came up to him and said, "Here's a gift," and he handed him a box. When a guy opened the box, there was a dead rat in it. That's the kind of gift that I don't think counts as a gift. And I just don't think hanging on because you can die in public is um, is much of a gift either. OK. Uh, I will defend Prince Harry and Meghan. OK. I, I just think I think he did the best he could. And and there's a part of me as I'm reading the book. And again, it's wonderful. It's beautifully ghostwritten. And I mean that. I have a feeling Charles is secretly saying, just destroy this for me, please. Just 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 end it. End my misery. The uh, Governor DeSantis of Florida. Would you prefer Trump to get the nomination or DeSantis? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, think I, Trump, I think I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any possibility that Trump can get elected. But I'm worried about DeSantis, in part because people don't know much about him. 
They think they do. They see them on television every once in a while, but they don't know what Floridians know. And unfortunately, in Florida, as the change in demographics occurs, he is extremely popular and he really won uh, kind of in a landslide in the midterm elections. But Christy Nome, who um, North Dakota, the, she she's a South Dakota's governor. South Dakota. And uh, she sent somebody out the other day to make a statement. And the statement basically said, you know, Ron DeSantis says he's pro-life. And then he gets behind. And I think the phrase he used hides behind the 15 week ban on abortions. He continued Does that mean he doesn't think that 14 week old babies have a right to life? That's pretty over the top. Yeah. And and, um, so there's this kind of baby from these other potential people. Chris Chris Sununu, who, um, you know, would have been in the Senate, but he decided to run again successfully for the governor of New Hampshire. But he, too, uh, has been issuing statements suggesting that there's something wrong with Ron DeSantis. Sununu is very conservative. I think he's at least as conservative as his um, his father, John Sununu, who, was, of course, the chief of staff in the White House. But um, this sniping is good because sniping makes the Republican Party look bad. It looks bad. In the extraordinary and singular case of Donald Trump, the more people, the more he irritated people who were potentially going to be his rivals within the Republican Party, he got away with it. That doesn't always happen. Sniping often is deadly. And it's when, when you found Hillary, you know, going after Bernie and it had, it has an impact. In most cases, and I, but I want to see this happen on a regular basis, starting like tomorrow. Let's have more Republican would-be presidents attack each other, and then let's see if Donald Trump wants to join in. He already has, you know, said disparaging things about DeSantis, whom he believes uh, is his chief rival for the nomination. But um, have at it. Okay, before you go, you are a member of the Supreme Court bar. You're an attorney. I've been really critical of Merrick Garland. I think he is a lot smarter than he lets on. Yeah. And it's death by a thousand cuts with Donald Trump. I think he is wearing the Trump family down. And once Donald Trump can no longer run for president, what happens? What does Merrick Garland do? And will the Republicans secretly support Merrick Garland? Would you would you think that DeSantis wants to see Trump go to jail? What what would I think he wants? I think he wants to see him prosecuted. DeSantis does. He wants him to go to jail. But he wants him to be convicted of a serious felony. I think they all do. Even the most sycophantic, like the uh, non-governor of uh, of Arizona, Carrie Lake. I mean, she can talk about what a wonderful guy Trump is. She's obviously hoping if he gets the nomination, he'll pick her as the vice presidential candidate. But deep down inside, she cannot believe the nonsense that she's coming out with about the stolen election in Arizona any more than she could really seriously believe that the presidential election was stolen and it, Donald Trump really won. Is it conceivable that Merrick Garland and Biden, again, don't, don't like either one, not, you know, no Medicare for all, you're my enemy, you're my enemy. But in the grand sweep of history, people like Michael Beschloss, multimillionaire with his Italian eight uh, furniture and marble floors, you know, these people who record history, 
Is it conceivable that the way they will write history is that Merrick Garland filleted Donald Trump, ruined him politically once Trump was not the nominee in 2024? It set the stage for his conviction. Will they say that? Is that the way? Is that the plan? On on whose plan? Garland's you, plan is just keep poking the bear, yeah. tire him out, and yep. then when he's no longer the alpha bear, go in for the kill. Yeah, I do think so, and I do think that that will be so obvious to somebody. <laughs> Uh, some of these historians that, uh, you know, live on talk shows now. Yes. I think they'll say, yeah, he did a day. He did a good job. Right. I mean, they're barely. I also. I mean, do you think I, he's doing a good job? You know, I hate to be oh, an incrementalist. Not. These these are hard trials to win. Of course they are, because so many of these statutes require knowledge of what you're doing. And I, I have failed in, uh, to see the evidence, horrendous as these charges are, that they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, that's the standard in criminal cases, that he consciously understood what he was doing and knew that it was wrong. I He's think delusional. But and I think that works against him. I mean, that works against, against prosecuting him. I, I read the January 6th report. Mm. It's beautifully ghostwritten. Beautifully yes. ghostwritten. Uh, they did a pretty good job making the case that he knew. The, the, what is it? Mens rea? Yeah. The intent? Yes. Yeah. He, Every crime doesn't require knowledge, but most most of these do. I think they do a pretty good job mm. proving that everybody told Trump it's over. So he went out and looked for Sidney Powell, this guy Eastman, Rudy Giuliani. Sure. He went out of the White House to find people who would sp spread the lies. We got to wrap it up. OK. Uh, movie. Well, favorite movie of the week. Um, I have spent so much time because my book is not ghost written, trying to track down people, get copyright permissions for photographs. I haven't seen a movie in at least a week, not since I was on with you last week. OK, I saw nothing. The Reverend, I, I, the Reverend, that? I'm gonna, we, we have to wrap it up because I'm yeah. running behind. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is a lawyer and an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And for nearly a quarter of a century, he ran Americans United for separation of church and state. His fourth book is about to come out in March, and we will be talking more and more about it. Maybe we'll do a book launch at office hours. Yes, Stay out of trouble, Reverend. Only good trouble. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you, Reverend. That was great. And sorry to keep you waiting. Join us for office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Go to my website for the Zoom link. And it starts at 8 p.m. and it goes for 24 hours straight. Usually I'm there for the first two hours and you can meet wonderful people like Dave and P.A. who has just finished. Where are we now with the F.U.? That is the Feldman University plaque for the dean's office. Is that correct? Yeah, I finished the F.U. and now I'm getting really sleepy. Oh, OK. <laughs> Then don't listen to my show. That'll help you stay awake. <laughs> no, it went right over your head, Dave. I, I guess that's uh, the war trail. That's why you're balding. Well, as long as we're, you know, videotaping this uh, and you're sleepy, what about operating some electric saws for us as you're sleepy? That could be entertaining. See what where that takes us in terms of mistakes, blood. Sure, blindfolded. Action. Blindfolded. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dave and PA. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank good you. to be back. It's good to see you both. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Bye-bye. It is time once again for the professors and Marianne, Professor Marianne Cummings, particle physicist, 
Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois, Professor Ann Lee writes the Ukraine update every day over the Daily Kos, along with other great articles. Professor Adnan Hussein is chairman of the Religion Department over at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. He also co-hosts Guerrilla History, as well as the Mudgeless podcast. We'll find out who your guests are. And Professor Jonathan Bick teaches the Twilight Zone every Friday night at office hours. He also teaches Star Trek every Saturday at office hours. And maybe, maybe you'll screen another movie. We watched The Trials of Henry Kissinger last Friday. Could be, David. Are you thinking of a movie? Uh, at this very moment? Yes, I do have some movies in mind if you'd like to. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk yes. about that all in a second. Joe in Norway providing us with ASMR for the eyeballs. What are you cooking for us tonight? Hey, David. Yes, uh, Cameron in our community asked me if, if I had some pressure cooking tips for him. So I figured, why don't I try to cook as many dishes as I can in a pressure cooker in one hour. So now I've seen you work with a, a pressure cooker before. It's, it's remarkable. I, I use it almost every day. How quickly can you cook rice and beans in a pressure cooker? These beans are these, I soak the rice with basmati. It's going to take five minutes under pressure. And these are unsoaked uh, black eyed peas. Those will take 10 minutes. And then I have some spinach, which I'll cream, which will take just uh, half a minute. And what we're going and, to do and at I'll the saute end. I'll saute some lettuce in there, too. And then particle physicist. Not, ex not exactly sure what I'll make, but uh, we'll figure it out as we go. And then at the end, particle physicist Professor Mary Ann Cummings will explain the science of a pressure cooker. <laughs> and we'll find out if you really are a particle <laughs> physicist. <laughs> with the, the yeah, be, because we use those a lot. Do you really? <laughs> no. Oh, what do I know? Don't they have like pressure accelerators? Oh, those are particles. Uh, okay. I, what do I? What do I know? They're at the All center of the fusion experiment. Is what Marge Simpson told Homer when he asked her, how do I use the pressure cooker? She says, don't. <laughs> well, that food that you're looking at is perfect. And you could live forever eating that. And mm -hmm. I'm always hungry whenever Joe starts cooking. But I can get up, walk into my kitchen and get something to eat. There are people in America who can't. And that's why everybody should donate right now to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A dot org, Rahima.org. It is a food pantry in the Bay Area near San Francisco that provides for refugees who have made it to America. We create a lot of refugees around the world. We don't let too many in, but the ones who do get here learn very quickly that we're not as hospitable as we present ourselves. So Rahima.org is a food pantry that provides good, nourishing food. And you give $5 to Rahima.org, that goes a long way with the right kind of food. So go to Rahima.org and donate. It was set up by Professor Adnan Hussein's parents, Anything you'd like to add to that, Professor Hussein? No, David, just to thank people who have donated in 2022 and quite a number of people from this community who donated uh, to Rahima Foundation for my birthday fundraiser earlier this month. I really appreciate it and um, hope we can continue uh, to support uh Refugees uh, who um, need, you know, Brahima Foundation is actually looking to try and do more with connecting refugees to the other social services. And so they're applying for grants to 
um, develop a, you know, a project where they can help people even more than the assistance they give, but to do more connecting them to all the surfaces, other services that may be available. Because very often people come in such a state of um, trauma, of isolation, uh, that it takes them a really long time. Uh, you Oftentimes they don't know the language, and of course they don't know anybody. And so it takes them a very long time to even discover what resources are available in their communities through various uh, municipal or charitable uh, organizations and social services. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So anything people can do to help will go a long way to getting these people on their feet after more often than not, I'm afraid, United States uh, intervention has sown chaos uh, in their regions and forced them to flee, whether it's from Central America or the Middle East and Central Asia. So do be generous. You can go to rahima.org. Uh, R-A-H-I-M-A dot org and uh, make a donation. Thanks so much. Again. Okay, thank you. And we've just gotten word that Lisa Marie Presley has died at the age of 54. I, oh. I think I just saw her at the Golden Globes and she was briefly hospitalized. Lisa Marie Presley dead at the age of 54. Poor girl. That is... Uh, Priscilla Presley said in a statement Thursday evening, it is with a heavy heart that I must share the devastating news that my beautiful daughter, Lisa Marie, has left us. Uh, she was the most passionate, strong, and loving woman uh, I've ever known. All right. As Philip Roth said about getting older, it's a massacre. Ah, uh, Unbelievable. I want to talk about Code Pink and Medea Benjamin, one of the great, uh, one of the great activists in American history. I, I've seen her interrupt Henry Kissinger testifying and just screaming in his face, "War criminal, war cr like right in his face, war criminal, war criminal," and. I wish I could play the tape. I'll find it. And he's going, yes, I, I know. I know. Yes, I'm over. Like he's just nodding his head. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. to, And she is doing the Lord's work. Medea Benjamin with Code Pink. She and Olivia DiNucci showed up at the Brookings Institute uh, last Wednesday. Uh, they were having a seminar about Ukraine with... Congressman Adam Smith, he's the Democrat from Washington, who used to be Armed Services Committee chairman. And it was the Brookings Institute, which is a is it fair to call it a Democratic neoliberal think tank? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. And they were talking about defense spending and Medea Benjamin had enough. And she and Olivia DiNucci decided they were going to participate in the seminar. <laughs> this may be one of her best pieces of work. This is Medea Benjamin. I think this is her finest moment in a long time. Framing, and I, let me pick up if I could. Right, the fake framing was actually not fantastic. Right now, the two real security threats to the world are nuclear war and the climate crisis. And unfortunately, Congressman, the way that both the Democrats and Republicans have been pushing us in this war in Ukraine, where we definitely condemn Russia, but we need negotiations. If we keep pouring billions and billions of dollars into this war, we're taking us to the brink of a nuclear war. Let's listen to the chair of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, who said, seize the moment, go for negotiations. Raise your hand here if you'd like to see negotiations instead of a nuclear war. None of you? Come on, there's got to be something. Actually, I'll take that as the first question because I think it's a good point. Well, I was ask asking the audience that, actually. But, but I know, and Michael, I know you're a big cheerleader for the Iraq really? War and for other wars, so you don't really have a lot of legitimacy 
diplomacy when it comes to using diplomacy, not war. But I think let's just put it in the context. So you don't want to hear any United sort of States. discussion. You just yeah, want to talk. I just talk. want to end my my point yeah. here, which is to say that it's a shame that 30 Democrats who signed a letter to Biden calling for negotiations were so right. pilloried by people like you in the Democratic Party. I didn't Party pillory them at all. Through their letter after 24 hours. The Democrats have to get back on board of calling for negotiations and not leave that to the extreme right of the Republican Party like Marjorie Taylor Greene. They shouldn't be the ones with the rational voice in all of this calling for negotiations. Democrats have to step forward, have to put the pressure on the Biden administration and say we need negotiations, not more war. The real security, you know, national security is addressing the climate crisis, getting people housed, and not focusing on weapons. These eight hundred and eighty billion dollars going to war. Well, actually, I think it's worth worth having that discussion. And I will say that I met with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Ass this morning, and you will not be surprised to know that he doesn't actually agree with that. Okay, uh, you can you hang on. You can hear me now, correct? Yep. So here's what I would like to do, because uh, usually this time, uh, Professor Anley gives us an update on the situation in Ukraine, and I want to do that in a second. I would like to talk about the sizzle of what I just played and then the substance. Did did the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, really say that, what he believes in diplomacy and negotiation? But in light of Hakeem Jeffries getting every Democrat to vote for him for speaker, talk to me if you could about the sizzle of seeing Medea Benjamin uh, being performative and how it struck you in terms of uh, motivating the left and being political. Professor Marianne Cummings, what was your specifically oh. the sizzle, the performance aspect of it? I love it. She's uh, I mean, she was disruptive, but very nonviolent, actually, for being disruptive. She was kind of polite, almost, but she got to the point quickly. That whole video took less than two and a half minutes, and she made just, you know, several very succinct points. Um, you know, it's amazing the, the, the journey that people who call themselves left have taken since Bernie Sanders, when asked in one of the first um, presidential debates with Hillary Clinton, primary debates, they were all asked what the greatest threat to U.S. security, to the security of the world was, and he said climate change. And there was an enormous round of applause from the uh, audience where we were hosting that debate watch. And now it's like... Every progressive in Congress enthusiastically votes to keep supporting the Iraq war. Nobody talks about Green New Deal. I mean, there's there just seems to be like, you know, th th this is right. like Medicare for all falling off the radar. And there's a Medea Benjamin just, you know, snapping everybody out of it for a couple of minutes. Right. Professor Ann Lee, who writes over at the Daily Kos. It was interesting. They had to bring in a female security guard to wrestle them out. So the Brookings Institute was very much aware of the optics. You're oh, you teach your specialty is optics. What what how were the optics? How smart was Medea Benjamin? Well, I, I think uh, as most code. Code pink actions are they actually are relatively, uh, you know, uh, direct and um, you know, message forward. Um, I I think that that's uh, that's their whole goal is to make sure that uh, the message gets delivered. It isn't really about the performance so much it is, as it is really about the message. You wrote that she was on message that she stayed on message. Yes, yes, she she did, and and they always do. I. 
even despite the very strange things sometimes they do to sort of transgress on a uh, a fairly standard uh, uh, congressional dem- uh, 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 hearing sort of uh, s- shot. But I think that they're fine. I think that it's important to do that in a democracy. It it really is about democracy in that sense. Um, right. It 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 um, and it's not it's not isolated. Other other countries do this. They there are um, there are people protesting against continuing to protest against the war, the Ukrainian war, um, with this kind of direct action. Um, and you know, it, it. I think it's important to do. Adam Smith, uh, Congressman Adam Smith, uh, engaged with her. He knew who she is. It was she almost became uh, uh, an additional panelist. Professor wow. Jonathan Bick. That was, go oh, ahead. Sorry, go. No, no, you go. Go ahead, Professor Adnan. Well, that was because that was the point I wanted to make, which was that she looked very comfortable up on the dais, like she belonged. In fact, actually, what's really disruptive is that voices like hers are not heard on any of these panels. They're constituting panels by excluding and marginalizing the real range of opinion. So it's so disingenuous of Representative uh, Adam Smith to say, I actually think that is something that should be discussed in debate. Well, what have you been doing for the last uh, 11 months? Uh, When have you introduced... uh, You know, any open forum uh, to really discuss the range of positions of the key questions and hear from multiple perspectives. We haven't. So that was disingenuous. What was so good about this is that she came on. She looked like I mean, I think it was great that she had a uh, optic speaking, a kind of nice, bright purple, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, a sweater or blouse on here, caught the eye went to the center, as uh, Professor Marianne was was saying, spoke in a very reasonable tone of voice. She didn't go in and immediately shout some chants. She presented a p- set of positions as if she was on the panel because, in fact, actually that point of view should be on there and she should have been allowed to stay and hear what, you know, Adam Smith had to say. I listened to part of the rest of the video and... I don't think he had very many good answers. Uh, he, uh, you know, blew a lot of smoke. Um, I think misled people on a certain, you know, uh, set of issues. And I think she could have responded. Even when he tried to engage her, she handled him beautifully. She put him in his place. You know, she said, well, you know, answered his questions, moved quickly back to her point. Um, and I thought it was very effective and well done. Right. This, we're talking about the sizzle, Professor Jonathan Bick. You know, an army has to keep fighting. Otherwise, their their uh, swords get dull. You got to keep your blades sharp. She is constantly doing this. So she's gotten great at it. You you. So what does that say about the protest movement in this country? There are some great. The the Black Lives Matter people were incredible protesters who really were on message and kept it peaceful despite the Republican racist propaganda against BLM. They weren't responsible for any violence or looting. Uh, What was your reaction to the sizzle, the perform the performance? Well, I think that uh, protesters should study uh, this performance and really try to emulate it because, uh, you know, she did appear to be reasonable. Uh, I think she made it clear that, um, you know, her position, which is not only the correct one, uh, but it it is a uh, eminently reasonable one that is not represented on mainstream media. And, uh, you know, the idea that she has to do this, she has to risk being arrested in order to get this point of view across, says something about the mass media in this country and how tightly they are controlled by 
uh, their sponsors, by the fact that they are for-profit corporations, and that they have a vested interest in the status quo. And the status quo is producing weapons uh, for export and for use all around the world. And the media are uh, complicit with in, you know, creating these um, illusions about these conflicts and, you know, the, completely erasing, uh, you know, the fact that the U.S. may have a, a some sort of a role in this, uh, in precipitating this crisis in Ukraine um, historically, and that... Um, you know, they they obscure that while at the same time they create a very black and white. There's a good guy. There's a bad guy. We're on the side of the good guy. You can't question our motives because we're the United States. And don't look at everything we've done in the past 200 years. Um, you know, just just believe us. Right. Just, just, th just think it's going to work out, you know, that we have the best interest of the Ukrainian people in mind when we're supplying them weapons, uh, when we're uh, dragging this war out, when we are lining up BlackRock to uh, rebuild the country after it's been destroyed right. by this war. Right. It's all for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. Just believe that. Right. Zelensky so, did meet yeah. with a representative from BlackRock, to, you know, re, literally reconstruction. Let's talk about the 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 substance. Uh, Professor Marianne Cummings, we've played clips of uh, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Milley, Mark Milley. I played uh, him at a press conference saying, short of diplomacy, this will be a grinding war of attrition with no end in sight. That is what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said. Short of diplomacy, this will be a grinding war of attrition. And yet Congressman Adam Smith glibly, authoritatively said, that's not what he said. He just Adam Smith just tosses it off to Medea Benjamin like you don't know what you're talking about. What? Because he knows that he won't be questioned. I mean, if liberals are watching this, you know, they they listen to NPR and they watch MSNBC and they think they're informed. Mm -hmm. you know, so they're not going to even say, wait a minute. You know, Millie said something very interesting the other day or he said something revealing. You know, early on when we were discussing this yeah, months and months ago, I pointed out about three or four times when publications like Time or the Associated Press or even Reuters published something that just kind of went against the narrative of the military or the, the narrative of the State Department and, and the White House. And they were all it was all sources from the military that basically they early on remember. People probably forgot that that there was the accusations of Russians using the, the Russians using white phosphorus and and banned chemical weapons. And I think it was the Reuters article where they you know, the Defense Department said that they found no evidence. The Defense Department also very gingerly said they didn't find any evidence of massacre in Bucha. And in the Time magazine article, it uh, they were quoting Pentagon sources that said the Russians were coming in rather lightly. They were actually taking on casualties themselves to it to avoid even greater civilian casualties. At the time, people were saying Russia was weak. They didn't know what they were doing. They thought they could just take over Ukraine. But of course, if you actually listen to what the Russians wanted to do, and at the time that there were serious negotiations going on in um, in Istanbul, um, you know, they did operate with a goal in mind, which is to get everybody back to the negotiating table. Now, months later, we found out that that was sabotaged. But, you know, um, yeah, the defense 
not that uh, not not uh, Austin, but you know the actual generals will either leak some counter narrative or they'll say the truth once in a while because they know. And when he says the war of attrition, that's a that's um, a rather well defined concept in military terms. So Scott Ritter was explaining it. It was like you get the enemy to come to you in in a situation that constrains them and fight and you can take them out so that the Russians in these battles uh, are racking up casualties on the Ukrainian side. They are themselves taking some casualties. But when you go out of mainstream media, you know, the consensus is five to one to ten to one kill ratios. Yeah. You know, let me let me play the clip. Oh, that's what they mean. Let me play the clip of Mark Milley. It was uh, I believe it was last. I think it was last summer. Uh, he was asked how this thing ends. Uh, in terms of most likely, though, at this point, and, and this is always subject uh, to, to debate, but at this point, uh, we have a very serious grinding, grind, uh, grinding war of attrition going on in the Donbass. And, and unless there's a breakthrough uh, on either side, uh, which right now the analysts don't think is particularly likely in the near term, uh, but unless there's a breakthrough, it'll probably continue as a grinding war of attrition for a period of time until both sides see an alternative way out of this, perhaps through negotiation or something like that. Perhaps through negotiation or something like that. Well, I'm, I should point out, David, that, you know, uh, there's there have been several Democrats that have said, well, that's what we want. Uh, we want a war of attrition to grind down uh, Russia. And the fact that Ukraine is going to be ground down in this process uh, is, you know, that's all right with us. Uh, and as long as we can grind down NATO allies also <laughs> are getting economically ground down. I mean, it's. Yeah, let's not overlook that as well. Right. I mean, the, uh, you know, the lack of natural gas going to the UK, uh, people are, are not able to turn on their heat because it's so expensive. Uh, they're either just choosing between eating or heating their their homes. Um it's causing inflation uh, in Europe and around the world, including the U.S. There are a lot of uh, negative outcomes uh, to this. So ending it quickly uh, would be the best outcome. And, you know, doing it through diplomacy, I think, is the only way. I want to turn to Professor Ann Lee and get the latest on Ukraine. But Professor Adnan Hussein, your thoughts? Well, just to follow up on that, I mean, I've been uh, noticing that um, The Economist, which I read when I'm traveling, especially because you can just pick it up and go through it uh, for a flight uh, over this uh, holiday break, I noticed was doing its very, very best to try and suggest that because it had been a warmer fall and a very mild winter up to this point that it looked like Putin's gambit, you know, might not work and that there was optimism that the reserves uh, would be there for March and, 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 and April. Um, and, you know, they're trying to spin, you know, everything they possibly can to avoid uh, confronting and dealing with the fact that, one way or the other, quite soon, there is going to be real economic consequences felt very sharply and that there already are signs of great frustration um, and that as the, the longer the sort of centrist and so-called sort of center left refuses to really engage with these issues and express some urgency around diplomacy, the rise of the far right uh, is going to, you know, be inexorable. I mean, there's so many issues that it seems that the far right is able to capitalize on and promote as a sort of faux populism, but it, they are able to do that because we are not seeing enough of a reaction like Medea Benjamin is trying to inspire um, in the larger left movements and especially in, among our, our, our politicians. Right. So, um, I can only, 
you know, reinf- uh, reinforce and underscore the message that that message of diplomacy, um, you know, I, what we've seen is that there's been even a little shift. So the Mark Milley uh, quotes and some other things are a response in some ways to even the muted kind of suggestions over the summer that there are some people who would like to see diplomacy. Uh, so you get these people, uh, politicians saying things uh, and military officials saying things like, we all recognize and understand that it will have to end as a, you know, uh, through diplomacy. But what they mean is more war and, you know, until our side is victorious. And then, yes, we will force Putin to sign. This is the idea that they're going to force Russia to sign an agreement respecting, you know, Ukraine sovereignty over Crimea. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. these sort of outlandish um, kinds of uh, suggestions um, that really aren't about being open to diplomacy, but are actually about promising victory, no matter the cost, um, unless somebody is willing to begin these, you know, negotiations now, which is what needs to happen. They're not really, it seems to me, in favor of a, a genuine settlement. Well, Professor Ann Lee writes a nightly update on the war in Ukraine over at the Daily Kos. Everybody should subscribe to Professor Ann Lee. She writes under the name Annie Lee over at the Daily Kos. Tell us what's happening in Ukraine, please. Well, you know, I I think it's really important to remember that, yes, um, diplomacy should actually diplomacy is going on. In in one sense, they have to prepare for a a summit that's coming up in February. And I I think there will be greater discussion of that. Um, I think it'll move more forward to that when uh, I I think there is going to be a, um, a deadline more or less put in place. I think they, there should be only one more great offensive because the Ukrainians uh, are being only given, I think, only one chance to move Russia off the territory. And then it just goes to capitulation and diplomacy. So there, I think that, that there is a kind of limit of all of this saber rattling and developing and sending more weapons. But the on the ground, it is much more complicated. There's tremendous disinformation. So, for example, the U.S. promises and Biden promises 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, blah, blah, blah. The Russians today announced that they've already they've already destroyed four of them, but none of them have been, you know, they haven't even shipped them. So we're at this really strange state of of, of affairs. In that, other words, um, you, you, the Russians are lying about those. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> but but this is just, you know, the kind of uh, the way it normally is. The the last couple of days have been fighting over whether the Russians have actually had some sort of victory over Solodar, which is a, a, a small town north of Bakhmut in the eastern, um, in the western part of Luhansk uh, and, and north of Donetsk. And... Um, it's mainly being led by Wagner, the Wagner group. And currently that would be Putin. Uh, that's Putin's private army. That's that's right. Uh, his chef, who's who has a significant sized army, uh, although, you know, the estimates of its actual size are complicated as well. They do have control over conscripts and they are, you know, uh, killing off a lot. A lot of people are dying. And I think that going back to what. Um, Excuse me. Did you uh, see his chef runs the Wagner group? <laughs> he's called Putin's chef because he's made a lot of money doing catering for the Kremlin. Right. So. So there's hope for <laughs> Joe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Joe in Norway. <laughs> I think I have some. I think we have work for you. <laughs> <laughs> run our our private army. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, it's uh, uh, the current battle is over this small town, and and the hopes are that the Russians uh, have encircled and taken the town, but they're still arguing about it. Uh, what's below the town, and what's more interesting, is a whole network of salt mines. So there's 
there's these very deep salt mines in there. And so Prigozhin, the the head of, of Wagner, the chef, has been supposedly seen doing photo ops down in the salt mines. Well, so it, it has uh, this, chef uh, a more Cold War image of, of you know, what Russian Russian productivity is about, you know. Um, I mean, because it, it was always an expression about uh, everyday work being like going to the salt mines, uh, right. which I always found sort of an interesting turn of phrase. Uh, anyway, um, more tanks are coming. Uh, a fairly token amount, which is really interesting. And and everyone is just sort of giving them a major armor, giving the Ukrainians major armament and kind of dribs and drabs. So I think that there's this weird kind of the, the West does not, or NATO, et cetera, does not want to give um, uh, ma- uh, main battle tanks to the Ukrainians uh, at any large number to make them win quicker as if it were a NATO operation. And so it's this kind of very strange dance that uh, that they're trying to drive, uh, you know, essentially drive Putin crazy, which they are sort of doing. And it is a war of attrition to follow on the, the Mark Milley comment. Mark Milley made the biggest mistake, not so much about talking about diplomacy, but by talking about the actual casualty numbers, which are now more in the 200,000. Wow. And... Um, it, it uh, the the real numbers are, I think, very very problematic when you look at the actual numbers, as opposed to everyone, armchair generals making these calculations. Also, the other big constraint is artillery rounds, and I know that may seem uh, too you know too much uh, uh, like minutia, but no, the fact ahead. is the Russians are running out of ammunition. That they're running out of ammunition for their basic tube artillery, and that's becoming more complicated, much like they've run out of 70 percent of their major uh, cruise missiles. So it, there at some moment, there is going to be an attrition like end to this whole struggle. And so I think the spring offensive, whenever it occurs, will tell us that story, uh, because uh, otherwise it's just more complicated uh, uh, disinformation like we had even at the beginning of the war. For example, there are um, there are exercises, joint exercise again with uh, the Belarusian army and the Russians and more equipment is now being moved, currently being moved into Belarus. And so they may simply just try to take Kiev one more time in February. We'll see. I want to ask you, we had, by the way, we have Lawrence Wilkerson, Colin Powell's chief of staff, uh, on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour this weekend. And Colonel Wilkerson is, history will remember him very fondly. He's the only one who's come clean and has offered up a blueprint, an explanation of how you get suckered into a quagmire. The rest of them refuse to do it, obviously, including Colin Powell. Uh and he was talking about war and how small the American army is. And I wanted to ask you, Professor Ann Lee, about how we're sold the idea that we can win war from above. Ukrainian soldiers are coming to America. They're learning how to operate Patriot missiles. Supposedly, they're going to be here for a couple of months. So that doesn't bode well for uh, diplomacy. Uh, or an end of the war too soon. Obviously, we want to test, I think it's Raytheon's uh, Patriot mm-hmm. missiles to see if we can shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. Hopefully, uh, Putin won't be out of any missiles by the time we get the Ukrainians back home to use the Patriot missiles. We're sold this idea, Professor Ann Lee, here in America that we can win wars from above without boots on the ground. And we spend trillions, not on soldiers, but on winning from above. Is Putin trying to win this war from above? Can wars be won from above? No, they they can't. It's just simply a, um, a trope, as it were, and we use that with every war. Uh, air, air superiority is important. And in fact, 
this war has a problem with air superiority. Um, NATO can't put the full weight of its own um, um, air power forward, and Russia can't because at least we've given them enough air defense to take take care of it. So it is a kind of stalemate in that sense, um, forcing into a ground attrition. So, yeah, you can't have the shock and awe in this particular battle uh, because both sides are not able to fully express what they want to do. Um, Professor Adnan uh, Hussain, did shock and awe, other than temporarily shock Iraq and awe, Americans, did it work? We didn't get, uh, we didn't get uh, the leadership of Iraq, Hussein. For sure, it made for great TV, though. Yes, it did. Mm. I mean, you know, that's the thing. Uh, you know, the two Gulf Wars, uh, the Gulf War and the Iraq War. Really, I remember when the 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 Gulf War made uh, yeah. CNN into you know, the uh, huge uh, success uh, that it would be for a couple of decades before Fox, uh, you know, destroyed it uh, in the ratings. Um, So Americans like their wars to be on TV so that you can watch and see the explosions and the bombardment. Um, And of course, uh, you know, this was the time where they pioneered the embedded journalists, right? Right. Also where they were limited so that you only got a view of the ground war that was filtered through uh, even more closely what the Pentagon, you know, wanted than um, independent journalism might have uh, been able to provide in terms of uh, both the failures of the shock and awe to actually, um, you know, deal with... um, uh, uh, the Iraqi army. I mean, you know, you can disband the Iraqi army, uh, but if all of these people, um, you know, are not going to be employed in the new state because it was a neoliberal, neocon opportunity to do state formation on the cheap uh, without really, you know, understanding, you know, what a bureaucracy. I mean, these are people who are very hostile to government. I mean, that is the ideology of these people. So they went in and said, well, we don't really need like a massive police force. We don't need to keep these, you know, people who've been trained in arms, uh, you know, paid and in uh, military that where we can keep an eye on them and maybe kind of reform the structures and slowly develop a state system that transitions from an authoritarian dictatorship to something like a functioning state. No, they destroyed the state. And, you know, shock and awe wasn't going to kind of, you know, deal with, uh, you know, anything other than uh, some flashy bombardment, destroy, uh, you know, the government, put nothing else genuine in place of it. And then, of course, you had the insurgency. And supposedly this is an Islamist insurgency. This is what shows, you know, the real dynamics of history in the Middle East is if you destroy the left option, you get a conservative you know, a uh, jihadist option. Like that's just what ends up happening. Um, and so that's that's what happened in Iraq. Right. So I think the fact that Shinseki, if you remember General Shinseki, yeah. who very respected member of the military staff, just came out with the basic math, mathematical formula. If you're going to occupy a country of X million of people, you need X number of troops to have like something like a one to 20 ratio, because otherwise you're not going to be able to prevent an insurgency from happening or at least overwhelming and taking back territory. And nobody wanted to hear it. Rumsfeld fired the guy because he didn't give him the political answer that he wanted, which was this is not going to cost us anything because we're going to swoop in. It's going to be, you know, a cakewalk. uh, yeah, that's right. We're, we're gonna we're gonna change the entire Middle East by hitting this domino effect here. If we just, you know, uh, make a success of Iraq and decapitate it and use it to, you know, uh, implement all of our bizarre neoliberal uh, kinds of conservative anti-state sorts of ideas, it's going to be cheap. It's going to be fast, and um, you know, it'll it'll solve the problems for the whole region and on. All three uh, accounts, uh, Rumsfeld's strategy was a total bust. 
And Obama oh. made Shinseki, I think, head of the VA. Is that correct? Instead yeah, of I'm not sure. yeah, what did he go I think, on to? I, I think uh, Obama rewarded him head of the VA when he probably should have put him in charge of Afghanistan. Probably. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, that's Pro a good point. Professor yeah. Anley, you want to finish up your report? Thank you for this. Oh, it's uh, you know, the, the situation is relatively the same with all due respect. Uh, uh, there is a concentration of arms that's probably going to Poland is going to come out of this with a much stronger army in, in general and in, in the long run. And I agree with uh, Adnan at the um, the point will be, I think that at some moment, uh, Ukraine is going to be an armed camp for a while. I mean, it is going to be much more militarized. It is, regardless of the outcome, whether diplomacy works or not, and whether there's going to be a bloodbath, which could be when they try to take back uh, Crimea. Um, it's it's going to be, there's just going to be more war for a, a while, even if we get to a ceasefire or a um, some sort of relative solution. The the attraction to the United States is that we're doing it on the cheap. We're we're destroying uh, Russia's military capability. We've reduced it by you know forty percent or so, with only at the cost of a very small cost, five percent of the cost that we would normally take to reduce the military of, of Russia. So in that sense, it's a win. On the other hand, uh, I think that there's a lot more tor turmoil ahead, particularly in Central Asia. In the stands, I think um, Siberia might even decide they want to do something. <laughs> it, it, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. <laughs> right, <laughs> and I'm sorry to be so pessimistic about, it, but I agree with uh, you know Adnan. the The thing is, you know, the resource war is still there. It's going to be there, despite the fact that it's a light, a light winter, and the heating issues are not not going to be as much. Uh, we're going to see this real problem, but it has to be solved. I would assert before the next winter, because it's going to be a, a total debacle if if this gets to the next one. Right. Uh, what, in our limited time, let's go around and find out what everybody wants to talk about. Professor Jonathan Bick, what, what would you like to talk about? Uh, I wanted to talk, uh, give you an update on uh, COVID. Okay, good. Well, yours yours or America's in the world? <laughs> just, just mine. Oh, okay, good. How are you feeling? <laughs> Not bad, not bad. Okay. So, uh, can I tell you about yeah. my back? Because my back is a little. How, how is your back? Yeah, um, I, I, I'd complain, but. My knees are killing me. <laughs> your knees? Yeah. My. Oh, go ahead. Co please, with COVID. Uh, so, after two years um, of COVID. Is it two years or three? Uh, 20. 20 three sorry three. three it's three years old hey. COVID is three years I, old time flies when you're having fun yeah uh so in the well in the first two years of the, the pandemic we you know nearly 15 million people uh have died globally the terrible twos yeah yeah uh and more than a million americans have died and now we have a new variant that is uh, circulating in the U.S., XBB.1.5. Uh, it's been spreading quickly in the last few weeks. And as of Friday, it's made up 72% uh, of new cases in the Northeast and 28% of cases uh, across the country generally. Uh, it is, uh, it's not going to be the last chapter in the coronavirus's evolution however i mean uh, most experts are agreed on that uh and it has um you know these mutations keep on happening and it seems to be getting better and better at spreading um the u.s and state governments are failing to protect the american people from covid in in my estimation uh, while some of this is due to the people failing to protect themselves, 
Uh, a great deal of the blame falls to the government for placing business activity above public safety. Hospitalizations, test positivity, and deaths are all rising at the national level, and reported cases have also been moving up after the uh, holiday lull. Uh, around 47,000 people are currently hospitalized with COVID, which is the highest number since last March. The Northeast uh, continues to see many of the worst per capita hospitalization rates, and r rates are rising quickly in the Southeast as well. According to the New York Times, higher test positivity rates are a sign that many infections are not reported, even if they're tested for at home. This results in a severe undercount of cases. The number of hospitalized patients with COVID is a more reliable measure because testing is more consistent at hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, since December, or since early December, um, we've been having between 400 and 600 deaths per day from COVID in the U.S. So that's more deaths than uh, the U.S. experienced on 9-11, 2001, from the terrorist attacks, right? Every week, Every week, more people are dying from COVID than from 9-11. The government should be um, distributing high-quality N95 and KN95 masks to Americans through the post office, in addition to COVID tests, which they just started doing again. And they should incentivize people to get a COVID vaccine every three to four months, because that seems to be the extent of the highest level of um, immunity that the vaccines provide. That's what Dr. Philip Hershenfeld was saying, especially if you're over a certain age, you should be getting it all the time. Yes. Yes. Only 34 percent of Americans have received at least one booster shot. Really? Yeah. And only one in, in only one state has has a majority of its residents been vaccinated with a booster. And that is a very small state of Vermont, where 54 percent of its residents have had one booster or more. So that means that nearly two thirds of Americans have only had two covid vaccinations. Uh, new versions of vaccines should be continuously updated to meet fast spreading variants of the virus and masks should be required in indoor public locations and on public transit. The Biden administration uh, recently restarted a program that's provided hundreds of millions of tests through the Postal Service, and you can get yours by going to covid.gov slash tests, and you get four free tests per address. Uh, there's a lot more the government should be doing. People think it's over. It is not. It is uh, spreading and who knows, you know, what it has in store for us in terms of variants going forward. The fewer people that get COVID, uh, the less chance there is that we're going to get another uh, variant. The fewer people who get COVID or yes. Right. OK. Wow. F thank you. It sounds like, um, you know, that that uh, stat about um, more than 9-11 every week really makes me think um, COVID hates us for our freedoms. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at the response. We Who had do we bomb? Right? Who do we bomb for that? We got to bomb hundreds somebody. and hundreds of billions of dollars spent on wars, homeland security, curtailing uh, American civil liberties, uh, endless spending on on the courts, on on uh, military responses, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we're we're not treating this as seriously. And no. I, I agree. I am really surprised just the basic type of stuff we could be doing, like fitting all public buildings and schools with a kind of H, a filtration system on their HVAC systems. I mean, uh, Henry Hakamaki talked about that at the irritable at, at COVID town halls, that that would be so much cheaper than dealing with what we are beginning to deal with right now again Tents being set up outside of hospitals again, 
for you know, for makeshift ICU units because people are coming in. Uh, you know, nobody's people are getting tested. You're right. People are getting tested in 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 the hospital in the hospital. Um, the actually the the uh, the death rate. If you just look ever since like September. First, if you just uh, average like the, the seven day running average has been almost flat and it's now beginning to rise a little bit as supposedly the cases went down by a factor of three. The cases have gone up in the last month. But, you know, I think just people aren't getting tested anymore uh, when you have an uh, administration that proclaims that the pandemic is over Um I don't know. They don't. Why they, do they not want to spend money on public health issues? Well, in defense of Biden, he's trying to get a covid relief package passed yeah. and the Republicans won't do it. He is, though, I think he's declared 14 covid emergencies. And this is probably going to be his last. Is that correct, Professor Bick? Uh, what is he running out? Uh, he I doesn't want to suppress the number of votes they had for Speaker of the House. Right. What, I, well, and, the and nobody's uh, wearing a mask. That's Professor Hussein. What would you like to talk about tonight? Mm-hmm. Well, there's so many interesting stories um, to talk about. I did want to mention something just about the Harry, uh, uh, you know, uh, parade on all of the evening comedy and talk shows. Um, did anybody ask him in any of these interviews about the casual way in which he described the number of people he has killed in Afghanistan? Uh, he spent a lot more time uh, talking about, and there's been a lot more attention about a little squabble between him and his brother that led to violence, but not much about the violence that he casually and without regret without a second thought, really. Uh, in fact, the whole point of his discussion of it in his book is that it's very blasé and he just did his job. Uh, nobody has talked about that. So before it, it, we let, start let me, I, crowning to... Harry the Spare, let's uh, you know give a thought for the victims uh, of his military career and of British participation in U.S. wars. Yes, mm. I, I think... And I'm reading the book now and I haven't gone to Afghanistan. I do know that he spoke uh, out against the criticism uh, that he says his words were taken out of context, that he I think he said that in the book, he says, I killed 25 uh, Taliban. Uh, They well, they were chess pieces. I was trained to mm-hmm. look at them as chess pieces on a board. And he he claims he wasn't being uh, cold hearted in the writing. Uh, he also well, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, yeah, sure. I mean, it's not that he was gloating about it, but he right. also expressed absolutely no uh, regret, remorse, regard um and of course also just says well you know they're chess pieces that's what i was taught well he also says he also says that he was a perfect candidate for the british military because of how broken he was that you know his mother had died his father he came from a loveless family he was desperate he had mental health issues he he says i was a perfect candidate to join the military Yeah, well, that's another great argument to end the dysfunction of uh, the royal family because clearly it puts impossible stresses and strains on people and it leads to, you know, uh, brutal killers like Harry being unleashed on the world. So, you know, uh, (laughs) I guess if he's that's if that's how what he's trying to accomplish the destruction of the royal family, you know, uh, there is a logic, deeper logic to that uh, rationalization. So you're saying and I agree with you. Because uh, I am a little intoxicated by Meghan and Harry. Uh, I, I worry that perhaps you've been, um, you know, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, kind of there's this there's this guy, Mencius Moldbug. Also, well, his real name is Curtis Yarvin. And he's this... Um, philosopher on the right um, who seems to have gotten 
attention recently. And J.D. Vance has said that he's very influenced by him. There's some other kind of extremist right wing Congress people who are Peter Thiel. Uh, sort of regards him as his kind of real muse and ins- in inspiration. Mm. And he has argued, I mean, he's in favor of authoritarian libertarian government, which, okay, how do you figure that one? Um, but of at least a very strong executive and that we don't really shouldn't have democracy because, you know, the people can't be, you know, trusted to, make decisions that are good for the benefit of society, somebody who really believes in hierarchy. And he has at some point said that he is in favor of monarchy. And if you talk to him about his views of modern history, he's part of this, he's initiated this kind of view of of the dark enlightenment, kind of a counter enlightenment that much of the enlightenment was really terrible for us. And You can see that his perspective is that the French, he has not gotten over the French Revolution and even, of course, the US American Revolution. Edmund Burke didn't get over it. Yeah. It's, I think he's a Burkean, like in, in modern times. And so he, he thinks that, you know, if you can pin him down, he'll say that we should really have a monarchical system that would be better for us. Well, Um, when you look at ambitious people like Kevin McCarthy, who will do anything for power, there, you you kind of think, well, you know, maybe it should just be inherited. I'm joking, but there, <laughs> I, I I do think you, if I had to choose between Kevin McCarthy and uh, Harry, people who were just born into it, so they don't have to compromise. I I don't mean that. I don't mean that. Right, but Kevin McCarthy did inherit it. His whole argument is, hey, it's my turn. I was told that I could be next, right? Which is sort of a almost yeah. a monarchical. And and so, you know, not that I want to say Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates are the Democrats of the you know, of this right. of this uh, maneuver, but um, they are saying, hey, you can't just um, you know inherit this position. Uh, right. We've been elected, and we're going to make our demands. And of course, it goes back to. The clip we started with, which is, you know, why is it that the Democrats are so unwilling to break ranks, to um, contend with one another over honest policy uh, differences and principles? Uh, They seem unwilling to do that. But on the right, there's a much more fractious um, bunch. And I don't think there's been that much hand wringing in the Republican Party about, oh, my goodness, we don't have unity. Sure, there's some crybabies, you know, in the center, you know, who are doing so. But what are we going to see happen? Do we think that Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates have been, you know, have lost politically in this in any way? No. They gained all kinds of positions that they wanted for, you know, changing some of the House rules and committees. They got some policy you know, issues that are genuine policy issues, uh, things that I think are horrible, like the Texas border plan will be brought to the floor for a vote. But presumably they're also, because of this uh, deep state, uh, Trumpism's deep state um, criticism, they are going to have potentially, it looks like a, you know, something like a new cook uh, commission to look into the interference, church, sorry, church, uh, commission uh, that has looked into the, you know, FBI's interference in domestic politics and possibly other uh, intelligence and security right. agencies. I don't know if this is really going to pan out, but that's rumored to be one of the. Um, and I think their first I think their first order of business will be looking into the assassination of Fred Hampton. I, yeah, know, I, yeah, exactly I, right. I know that's been bothering Republicans for years. What was yeah, the Cook Commission? You're from Illinois. Them, yeah. what, what was the Cook Commission? You're, was that? Sorry, the Church Commission. Right. But was what the was the Cook? The Cook Commission was on the rioting or poverty? What was? Yeah, I don't remember. There have been a lot of commissions. And so I got it confused, but I'm not sure what I don't remember what the Cook Commission there was. was. The Cook, I commission was about Cook Commission was either about the 1968 riots uh, at the Democratic Convention in Chicago yeah, or, yeah, or, poverty, or poverty or yeah. poverty. Yeah. 
well, you're something co- very 60s to care yeah. about. Well, we have Joe. Joe, you're a cook. Do you remember any commissions? Uh, <laughs> Professor Marianne Cummings, what would you like to? T- I have a question for you, Professor Marianne Cummings. You're a physicist, mm-hmm. correct? A lot of the adults who I speak to, Democrats who are adults, who, who, who are glad that there was unity, say to me, it's a lot harder to, to uh, build something up than tear down. That it's very easy to tear something down, but it's a lot harder to build. I live in New York, and I'm old enough to have seen uh, two IBM buildings in the same spot. In other words, they built a skyscraper, they tore it down, and then they built another one. Seems to me it's harder to tear down something. It's, I think it's harder to tear down a skyscraper than to build one. What, what are you? Yeah. That the, you have to do at least as much engineering in the taking down of a skyscraper. And when, when the two, Twin Towers came down, I just happened to be working with structural and material scientists and engineers because of my particular project at the time. That explained to me, because as an amateur, I thought, wow, that looks like a con- controlled demolition. And they explained to me all the physics and engineering that went, in, went into these mostly air structures um, so that they could, you know, maximize the strength and specifically the tensile strength of these buildings. They wanted to get them to get hit with a uh, category three or four hurricane and survive. They didn't quite, you know, or a small like a DC nine. They didn't, you know, imagine a seven thirty seven. But so yes, next time, a lot of engineering to figure out how these things would eventually come down if you wanted to bring them down in a controlled demolition. I think uh, one of a uh, one of our gang from uh, office hours who used to be part of uh, used to do that kind of thing said, oh, yeah, you know, bringing a building down is months and months and months of preparation and planning and putting the explosives exactly at the right place. And otherwise you'll get a half exploded building, half a block taken out because it (laughs) fell over rather than down. Right. So on and so forth. So very quickly, uh, because we do have to, is there anything Mm -hmm. you wanted to bring up? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, to listen to the Democrats, if you didn't un- know Democrats or Repl- Republicans and you're just an uh, outsider listening in, the Democrats have been wringing their hands and pointing to how awful it was that there was a week of votes going on in the Congress in a Democratic Republic. Oh, dear God. Um, although... It, you know, to their comment about it's it's hard to harder to build something up. They it is. It, they tore they tore down a progressive mo- movement quite effectively, at least at the federal level. I mean, Bernie's movement, at least for the time being, that is squashed. That's the Democrats who did it. That's the Democrats. Absolutely. But on the state level, I got to see a wonderful swearing in ceremony. Uh, remotely, uh, my friend Rachel Ventura was sworn in as state senator. And uh, already the tone of Pritzker, our governor, is, I don't really know, I would say, I wouldn't say exactly progressive, but Pritzker is not a stupid man. He knows who's in the Senate. He knows that even though Mike Madigan is gone, and Mike Madigan was for years and years ran the Democratic Party. <laughs> Uh, was uh, chased out on various corruption charges I won't go into, but it's fun to do one night. Uh, but his his machine is still in place. It was the machine that spent almost a million dollars. And that's no exaggeration, almost a million dollars against Rachel in her state Senate primary. Even the Herald noticed that and were, was just kind of everybody scratching their head. Why are they dumping all this money <laughs> into the state right. Senate primary <clears throat> to prop up a guy who's never had any like, you know, uh, political experience whatsoever. Well, because Rachel is a threat to them. 
And even the governor's comments are sounding a little more progressive than the normal run of the mill, you know, Illinois Democrat. So that was quite wonderful. Uh, she was being she was being sworn in in the old uh, in the old state building down in Springfield. That's why there wasn't room for a bunch of us to be in the gallery. So we watched from her office in, in Joliet, which is about a 15 mile drive from here. And it uh, it just it's it's invigorating. I'll be going door to door for John Lash, getting him on the city council uh, as uh, alderman at large here in Aurora. And it's I was just trying telling everybody you. It doesn't take a majority uh, of progressives, progressives in any body if you're willing to change things and if you're willing to like not be part of the club, you can have an enormous effect. You know, it just I mean, takes all it takes. One, this country is controlled by one percent. Yeah, all it takes Somebody is one showing up. One per, all it takes is one percent to want it more than the one percent who have it. Professor Ann Lee, we, yeah. we, we do. I, I don't mean to be rude, but no. Professor Ann Lee, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Uh, just uh, just quickly, I wanted to, to mention something that sort of ties a couple of things that we've already talked about. There are two new committees in Congress. Uh, one is on the quote unquote weaponizing um, you know, government, which is the Jim Jordan committee. That's gotten most of the attention. Uh, it's also called the tinfoil hat committee, uh, among other things. Uh, but the other committee is a select committee on the strategic competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. Now, I think that's the first time we've had actually comp competition designed between a nation in a specific political party. Right. So that's that's kind of interesting. And the, the reality of it, or at least I tried to assert that in a, in a brief uh, uh, posting, was that this was kind of the genius idea of a variety of lobby groups. So one of them is the new federal state of China, which is the lobby group created by uh, Miles Guo and uh, Steve Bannon. And uh, their goal is to overthrow the, uh, the current uh, government of the People's Republic of China. Oh, that would go well. That would go well. Oh, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah. They're the same group that promoted ivermectin uh, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Uh, uh, it, it is uh, clearly a reactionary element and bizarrely anachronistic. But this is going to be, I think, uh, very important as they, they try and recreate all of the same things when we get the continuation of COVID. You know, um, right. And they are looking in. There's another committee that's looking in to the origins of covid, which is. As a is kind of anti Chinese as well. Right. 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 Yeah. So we're going to be back uh, blaming Wuhan and uh, China again. So I think this is there's going to be more sinophobic kind of bizarreness. Right. And uh, this committee is going to be the, the means by which they give a lot of these things uh, some sort of airtime. Um, it it uh, you know aside from the fact that it supports other kinds of reactionary groups like the Falun Gong and et cetera, so that that that's the other thing to keep an eye out for. But mainstream media is not paying much attention to it by comparison to the Tinfoil Hat Committee. Yes, war with China. Bannon, hopeful. When is it? he's appealing the contempt of Congress? Uh, yeah, but. Uh, Thank you all, Professor Marianne Cummings, Professor Ann Lee, Professor Adnan Hussein, and Professor Jonathan Bick. Joe in Norway, you, you what what did you do? To, that's just torture. What is that? It's torture. Uh, it, it's a whole lot of pressure cooked food. Surprisingly, it's not just under pressure that you can use these things for. So I initially I. I cooked the rice that took five minutes under pressure with some spices like uh, cumin and mustard seeds and cashews. And then I, I threw in a sweet potato while the, the beans cooked. Oh, shoot. That's what I forgot. That's a the beans. Right back. Uh -oh. While he's getting the beans, who's on the Muchless <laughs> podcast, <laughs> Professor Hussein? Uh oh. <laughs> I knew I forgot. Well, on the Mudgeless podcast, um, 
We'll be having an upcoming episode on the kafala labor system that became famous because of the World Cup and people started paying attention to what happens in the Gulf. So we're going to talk about that uh, on guerrilla history. We have an upcoming episode in our Sanctions as War series um, on China and sanctions on, on China. And uh, people could also check out, I appeared on uh, Coup, Coup Save America with uh, Sean uh, St. Hart, uh, who is a follower of the show, and he has his own show. And I was on Ben Burgess's show with Harvey J.K. Wow. Talking about uh, Marx and the, you know, Marxist theory of history and British Marxists and um, G.A. Cohen. So we had a great uh, discussion. Oh, that sounds great. And if people are interested, they should also check out my discussion with Gene Bajalan on This Is Revolution uh, uh, tomorrow um, uh, about uh, the crusading society. So, um, And you're teaching this fine. Saturday at And I am teaching this Saturday. We will be continuing our discussion of uh, literature and crusade. And so it should be um, a fun discussion. Everybody's welcome. You can uh, get the Google Meet link by going to uh, www.adnanhussein.org slash courses and register for the link. Fantastic. Joe, you put the beans in now. It's got protein galore. Now the American proportions are finished. There Thank we you. go. <laughs> Looks beautiful. Uh, so, so I cooked some uh, black eyed peas, which just take 10 minutes. I threw a sweet potato in while they cook. So that didn't get over mushy. It's nice and firm. And then I quickly made a, a coconut spinach cream and then seared some uh, hearts of romaine. And then uh, for some uh, some uh, acid, we've got some quick pickled radish and pomegranate. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Joe, in <laughs> Norway. Follow. We'll see you this weekend. Yes, we'll see you at office hours. Follow Professor Marianne Cummings on Twitter at Razor Girl. What is Professor Ann Lee? What is your Twitter feed? Uh, it's uh, E State. Four column five. <laughs> e state S T A T E the number four. <laughs> okay. Column C O L U M N five the number five, and, uh, which is, signifies fourth estate, fifth column. Needless to say. <laughs> uh, and read Robert. read you over at the Daily Co's Annie Lee, Professor Adnan Hussein. Your Twitter handle. Uh, at Adnan A. Hussein, H-U-S-A-I-N. Right. And the A stands for A+. Plus. And everybody should give to Rahima.org. Professor Jonathan Bick, plug away. What are we going to be uh, doing? I would encourage everyone to uh, join us um, this Friday for office hours. We have uh, wonderful um, uh, presentations and uh, people there for discussion. And... Friday Eastern Standard Time, uh, I have, um, I'll have i be presenting a Twilight Zone starring Burgess Meredith. Is it and the, Fritz that's the, not the glasses one? This is a different not one. Not the glasses we've already, one. We, we've already seen that. We watched that one. But yes. uh, this is another classic with Burgess Meredith. I strongly recommend it. And maybe a documentary. And maybe a documentary. And two o'clock Eastern Time on Saturday, we have uh, Star Trek. Fantastic. Thank you all. If you would like to attend office hours, all you need is Zoom and a link. I can't get you Zoom, but I can get you the link by going to davidfeldmanshow.com, hit the office hours menu and subscribe to my newsletter. It includes a link to uh, office hours. Professor Hussein. Oh, I just wanted to mention that people should come to Spirituality and Activism on Wednesday evenings next week. Uh, Texas Tom Weber and I are going to talk about the concept of social justice, justice, but especially social justice in the Bible and the Quran. So it should be an interesting uh, discussion for, um, you know, people who are interested in you know, religion, spirituality, and of course, social justice. Activism. How do you do? How do you get the link? Is it on Zoom? You get 
it, it, the, the, it's, a, it's a Zoom call, but you can get the link by signing up to Discord and going into the Zoom link section, and you can find the link there and follow Tom, uh, Texas Tom Weber in uh, Discord. He always posts uh, messages that updates what the topic is that week and the Zoom link. Um, but you can always find the standing Zoom link um, in the, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's the hashtag sub um, I'm forgetting the lingo. I haven't been doing the Zoom links. Enough. Yeah, yeah, it's it is Zoom links. links. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everybody. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump.